If I do this full screen, that tab will be gone. Okay. Shall I see? Yeah, Hello, uh, Assalamu alaikum, and welcome to all of you. Today's session is on sales tax returns. We are going to focus on PRA, Punjab Revenue Authority, and we'll be covering the initial registration, both in the case you already have an NTN and you don't have one. We will then move on to e enrollment. Uh, in e-enrollment, we'll see both about the new enrollment and activation of the e-enrollment. We'll then move on to the actual filing of sales tax return with PRA. In that case, we'll uh, have a look at example of filing a new return, filing a revised return, as well as filing an altogether null return, which is also commonly referred to as the nil return. Uh, we will also have a look at uh, some of the ancillary issues. Um, we have some additional handouts for you, although not linked directly with today's session, but something that is complementary in nature, such as how do you actually pay the taxes, what is the process. And if you have a look in the handouts, uh, Harun Jang, the head of the member affairs, has very kindly shared those files with you already. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll begin our today's session. Okay, can we tell them where to look for the handouts? I mean, I haven't emailed them. Okay. They're available on the go to webinar control panel mm -hmm. under the handouts section. So I believe you guys would have heard that in the control panel for go to webinar, the program using which you have logged into this session, you have a section titled handouts. If you click on that, it says five out of five, and you have these PDF files, which you can use, and I believe also download for your own use. So these are the gifts for you. Keep them. Enjoy them. OK, so let's begin today's session. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Rabash rahli sadri wa yasir li amri wa ahluk tatim illasani yakkabu kawli. O Allah, open my heart and ease my task for me and remove the impediments from my speech so that they may understand what I say. Uh, some of you already might know me for those who have joined the session with me for the first time. Uh, I'll very quickly run through my intro. I'm basically a fellow ACCA member, FCCA. I'm also a CFA charter holder uh, with specialization in taxation, fraud management, and economics. I'm also a certified mentor and certainly hold the BSc honors from OBU. At the moment, I'm serving as a managing partner at Millennium Law and Corporate Company. And I'm also sitting on the board of a few corporate entities. Uh, with regard to trainings, uh, I'm privileged to have conducted sessions, including promotional, mandatory promotional training sessions of government officers at MPDD of government of Punjab, uh, professional trainings at institutions such as National Bank of Pakistan, uh, HBL, Lahore, Karachi Tech Bar, Lahore, Karachi Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, academic institution like um, UET, Barrier University, and last but not the least, our very own ACCA. Uh, for those of you who like to read, I'm also a regular contributor on technical issues related to our field in various English language dailies, Daily Nation, Times, Pakistan Today, Express Tribune. I also regularly write uh, as the sole contributor on economic and taxation related affairs uh, in one of the major research journals, perhaps the only one from Pakistan that goes globally the blue chip journal. Uh, being honored to have received ACCA's Exceptional Public Value Award, I'm also a life member and now fourth time serving Chairman Lyzen Committee of Lahore Tech Spa. I am also honored to be representing Pakistan at Global Tech Forum. I'm a member of ACCA Pakistan's MNP and chairing the Taxation Committee of the same. Uh, I'm also on the board of a few think tanks and have other professional associations, but that's pretty much about me. I'll skip to the next slides, which simply outline our existing associations, some of the media trainings and other professional contributions, a listing of academic and professional associations, etc. 
you will have this uh, presentation available so you can go through at your leisure time. So table of the contents just like I was discussing with you will begin by discussing taxation laws, direct courses and direct taxation, a bit of introduction history, uh, how the sales tax evolved in Pakistan to this stage where provinces are managing sales tax on services. Uh, you will have some handy uh, stuff for you such like PRA's contact details, PRA's text calendar, details of listed services and rest of the stuff as we have already discussed. Now I have uh, here item 14 listed distinctively as the question answer session but we will be taking question answers in between uh, and I promise you that inshallah I'll do my best to answer all the relevant questions. Uh, just one request uh, I know uh, taxation and local laws is an area which generate extensive interest and we appreciate your response for that. However, we have to focus on the time limitation. So I would appreciate if you could ask the relevant questions first and if we have any spare time at the end of the session, you can always ask any other thing. Uh, beside that, if you need to ask um, certain other professional queries, I will be sharing my contact details at the end of the session and you can certainly do that. Just a professional acknowledgement for today's session and the presentation that you are wearing several legislations and reports of Punjab Revenue Authority, Federal Board of Revenue and our own firm Millennium Law and Corporate Company have been utilized through the copyright West with these institutions and we are just giving a professional acknowledgement. Um, the topic is of such a nature that you can go in as much detail as you want and we have conducted sessions on similar topics lasting a day, two and even three. Uh, so considering the time that's been allocated to us, we will be focusing on the core area, the key component and by the end of the session you should be able to file a return and be able to have a very good understanding of the relevant components of the curriculum. So let's begin with taxation laws. Well, nothing too complicated about that. Uh, you are all accountants, professionals, and I believe you know that taxation laws are the set of laws which are used to drive revenues for the governments in order for them to function, execute their responsibilities, and serve their citizens. Pakistan actually has one of the most complex taxation systems globally, not just in the region. The focus is more on indirect taxes with different taxes to the tune of exceeding 70 distinct ones. Yeah, that's right. This has led to several set of laws, each dealing with specific taxation area. Uh, well, I just mentioned that the focus of the taxation system is on indirect taxes. Basically, there are two major categories of taxation. Uh, you can divide the taxation either in the category of direct taxes or indirect taxes. Very briefly, direct taxes are those that are levied on your income directly. You have earned something, your business has generated profit, tax on that, whatever it may be called, is a direct tax. That's it. Indirect taxes, on the other hand, are not levied on income directly. Rather, they are levied on transactions. Sales tax is basically an example of an indirect tax. It's basically an ad valorem tax. What do we mean by ad valorem? This means that the tax is dependent on the value of the transaction. So let's say you had a transaction, you um, bought some services of let's say 50,000. So the tax would be levied on that amount of 50,000. So it's ad valorem in nature. Um, sales tax in Pakistan is levied on sale of goods and services. Normally it's imposed on the gross price. What do we mean by gross price? This means the net cost to the seller, whatever they have paid to buy the good or the services, plus any carriage if there was a good involved or any transportation in case of a service, plus the sales tax that the seller has paid, plus seller's profit margin. That is all accumulated and the sales tax is then charged on that amount 
at every point along the chain of the sales tax. So basically sales tax is a cost to the end consumer and there is an element of double taxation involved because of the concept of cross price. So um, how did sales tax actually started? What's the history? How it evolved to this level? We'll run through this very briefly. Uh, we actually have to go to the pre-independence colonial era to start with the history. Under uh, serial number 48 of list 2 of provincial legislative list of the Senate schedule to the government of India at 1935, which read with section 100 subsection 3 thereof, the powers to levy and collect taxes on sales of good and advertisement. So the evolution started from sales of good and advertisement only. Uh, this was actually a provincial subject. This said 1935 act applied to Pakistan also. Why? Because it was included in the terms of Section 8 of India, uh, Indian Independence Act 1947. However, a year after independence, in 1948, sales tax was made a federal levy and the Pakistan General Sales Tax Act 1948 was enacted. This was later on superseded by Sales Tax Act 1951. So initially sales tax was levied only on sale and consumption of goods, not on services. However, through the taxation of goods, sales and purchase order in 1960, the scope of this sales tax under the 1958 one act was extended to include sales, importation, exportation, production, manufacture, or consumption of goods. So, after the evolution of the pre-independence, it was on sale of goods locally, basically, and advertisement only. Later on, after independence, what they actually did is basically started from the same point just adopted it locally and after some time they started evolving, increasing the sphere. So while it was still pretty much focused on goods, but now it was not just the goods locally supplied. Import and export was also covered within the ambit of this particular legislation. So by 1990, uh, we finally decided it was time to catch up with the world again. Sales Tax Act 1990 was enacted which replaced the last one, Sales Tax Act of 1951, and it introduced the current phenomena, um, at least that's active federally, because post 18 amendment, we know there have been changes which we'll discuss. So this introduced a bad style sales tax on goods in Pakistan. Sales tax on services, it might be of interest for you to know, was never a federal subject. What's the rumor? But before 18th Amendment, wasn't FPR handling it? Yes, FPR was. So doesn't that mean it was a federal subject? Not really. So what was happening? Essentially, the provinces have vested their right and power with the federation to administer and collect taxes on its behalf. So let's quickly run through it. Uh, it was a matter, the sales tax was a matter not included in the federal legislative list or even the concurrent list in the constitution. So the matters relating to the levy and collection of sales tax on services remained in the provincial domain. This position was further clarified and reasserted by way of the fifth constitutional amendment of 76 and 18 constitutional amendment the last one which we talk a lot about in 2010 and in 2010 it was uh, with regard to vesting the sales tax on services to the provinces. Uh, before you get confused just very quickly I have included these terms for completion so you have a background knowledge. Uh, you do not need to worry if you don't know much about it but I will tell you a couple of things. Uh, which are relevant and of interest, federal legislative list and concurrent list. Basically, the constitution is divided in these two lists. Uh, whatever falls within federal legislative list is an exclusive domain of the federation. Uh, with concurrent legislative list, the matter is slightly different. 
what it says essentially comes down to this that if a matter is uh, decided by province and untouched by federation, the province will hold sway. But when the federation will legislate on that, that would supersede the provincial domain. What uh, the 18th amendment did was actually take sales tax on services completely out and throw it in the embed of provinces and the provinces then actually started working on creating their own provincial bodies. Uh, in this regard, SIN was actually the first one to take the lead. In 2011, they enacted Sales Tax on Services Act, which was effective from 1st of July that year. Uh, the next one to catch up was Punjab, which enacted Punjab Sales Tax on Services Act in 2012 followed by uh, KPK. So uh, these uh, legislations that we use, for example, we are talking about Punjab. Um, I'll have to check with Harun. Maybe you might have covered Punjab sales tax on services. Act. If not, hopefully soon. So uh, this was actually legislated in 2012. What happens basically is every year with the Provincial Finance Act, this is updated for any changes be it in rates or any relevant legislation, and it's updated every year. Then you also have the Punjab sales tax rules, which is basically the practical handbook, how you go about these things actually. Um, I mean, uh, the act legislation basically gives you the principle. The rules actually tells you how to do that. So um, one other important thing that uh, the FPR through a notification withdrew FED federal excise duty on such services that were now covered within the ambit of the provincial legislation and bodies. It went effect from the same date that it is 1st of July 2011 in order to avoid double taxation. Okay, so far so good. We are about to get into the thick of things. So what exactly is PRA, Punjab Revenue Authority? Punjab Revenue Authority, we can go through this formal stuff and we will in a bit, but I'd like to talk to you informally about it. PRA is basically simply the provincial FPR. It's the provincial body to administer, collect the levies on behalf of the provincial government. And if you go on PRA's website, their vision state that they uh, actually envision themselves in a few years' time to be able to administer not just the sales tax on services, which they are currently interested to do, but all provincial levels. So the aim is to have one-stop shop for all provincial taxes. Now let's go back to the formal stuff. PRA is a body corporate having perpetual succession and a common seal. What does that mean? It doesn't matter a chairperson comes or goes, a government comes or goes, PRA is an institution created by uh, virtue of the powers vested by constitution in order to stay. It is headed by a chairperson who is appointed by the provincial chief minister on the basis of professional qualifications and under the chairperson at least four members and a secretary form the core of the trucks. Work distribution is on functional lines and subject specialization is the main consideration while selecting these members and other functionaries. Policy and other important work is carried out under the guidelines of an advisory council. Now this advisory council is composed of the finance minister of Punjab, the chief secretary, the Punjab, uh, chief secretary Punjab and the chairperson PRA also sits on it as well as the Secretary Finance Department. But one important and interesting thing is that uh, it's supposed to include at least four members from the private sector. So the aim is this, that there is actually supposed to be input coming out from the end consumer, the people who are paying taxes, the large business owner, different segments in the provinces. So uh, this is a good doctrine by PRA, which believes in inclusive tax policy formation. Initially, PRA undertook collection and enforcement of sales tax on 14 service areas. The system of sales tax on services is based on the universally 
accepted and cherished principles of self-assessment and self-compliance. But a word of caution there, recently PRA has introduced the concept of audit. It's a continuously evolving phenomenon. So while there is still self-assessment, there is now an element of check on it. So uh, it's not like entirely self-assessment anymore. We have the audit element there. Uh, PRA aims to gradually expand the base and scope of, uh, scope of these taxation services. What PRA has done is, in the legislation, it initially defined these 14 major service areas. But beside those services, it defined services. So what it essentially said is that right now we are administering these 14 services, but it does not mean that the others are outside our ambit. It just means we haven't yet covered them, but we will cover them in the future. Um, initially, with regard to the website development, the IT system, etc., Punjab government contracted that out to Pral. Punjab Revenue Automation Limit, uh, Pakistan Revenue Automation Limited, uh, which was already handling these services for FPR and had good systems and arrangements, especially at banks, financial institutions, national bank, etc. So it was uh, kind of a no brainer to have that in the entire period. The aim is to develop their own services meanwhile. Okay, here are a couple of uh, things for your on use, which should come in handy, the PRA contact details. You have details of their head office based in Lahore. It's basically in GOR. You have their contact numbers, fax number, and the email. Um, I'll share one thing. Uh, with regard to practice, uh, practice, their numbers, they are usually extremely busy, uh, particularly um, if we talk about the peak season, it's really hard to get through. But their email support is brilliant. You normally almost always get a response and in a timely fashion. So should you stuck uh, any roadblock, I would advise you to send them an email and yeah, do follow that up by a call. Okay, uh, what are the major legislations that covers the sales tax on services and its return and how to file that? You have already covered the Punjab Sales Tax on Services Act 2012 which basically has 13 chapters, 87 sections, and 14 broad categories of services. Punjab Revenue Authority Act 2012 was the actual legislation which gave birth to PRA, and from where the PRA drives its authority, and on the basis of which the other essential legislation was also done. Then we have Punjab Sales Tax on Services Rules 2012, which elaborate how the things are supposed to be done. For example, Punjab Sales Tax on Services Act 2012 states, you have to file your sales tax return monthly. Fair enough, good. How do I actually file that? Well, silent, where's the answer? Punjab Sales Tax on Services Rules 2012. You have to withhold a cer certain proportion of tax. Very good, how do I withhold that? The act is silent, where do I get the answer? The rules. You have to make the payment, brilliant. How do I do that? Rules. So the essence is this, they work hand in hand. The act gives you the idea of the legislation, the requirements, but the rules actually elaborate them. So uh, just one last thing and we'll be going straight into the thick of things, but before this uh, very useful calendar, something that should come handy for you the definition of the term service or services. It's been given in the statute, uh, subsection 38 of section two, and it's very exhaustive, rather all inclusive. There are four categories of services in the context of what we are discussing. The major covering act, Punjab Sales Tax on Services Act 2012. The first one are the services, which are services in business parlance and practice, but not covered in the first statute. So basically, the first schedule lists out all the possible services, and then they said, maybe we might have missed something, but that doesn't mean it's not covered within the ambit. It still is a service. What? Yes, it's a service if it's, an, it's uh, assumed 
and believed to be a service in the normal business practice, whether or not it's included within the first schedule. The services which are covered in the first schedule are services definitely, and the services which are listed and as taxable services under the second schedule. So if there's something in second schedule that is missed out in the first schedule, you can't say, well, since that's not listed in the first schedule, you can't text me on that. Yes, they still can. And last but not the least, services which are included in the exclusions of the second uh, schedule and hence are exempt. So all of them are covered within the embed of the services. So basically what this is saying is everything that is service and believed to be a service and business practice, whether or not that's listed there distinctively, it's a service. Okay, uh, another thing, this should also come in handy for you, uh, especially those who are practicing or plan to work in the field of taxation. You have the 14 major service areas listed and you have the date of payment and date of filing listed for all of them. Uh, it's pretty standard except for telecommunication for which the relevant dates are 21st of every month. Okay, um, then there's that uh, first schedule we just talked about. I'll just quickly show you the first schedule. So those of you who have missed the session on Punjab Sales Tax on Services Act can have a look on the classifications of these services. By the way, you do have this in the handout section. So if you feel the need, please open that on your system. So here it is, the first schedule. So uh, you can just go through this and see all the services that are listed. Uh, I'll just increase that so you can see it clearly. Uh, well, there's the major service area, services provided by hotels, restaurants, marriage halls, lawns, clubs, and caterers, and then you have the individual categorization within. So you can go through that in your spare time. We'll go back now. Okay, so far so good. So what have we done till now? We have discussed what taxation is, what indirect taxes and sales taxes are how the sales tax started in Pakistan and how it has evolved. And uh, needless to say, post 18th amendment, if you want to really sum it up, the present situation is that sales tax on services is governed by the provinces, administered, elected, legislated for, and overall looked after by the provinces. And how do provinces do that? By their provincial revenue bodies. Everything else is covered by the FDR, the income tax, sales tax on birth, federal excise duty, etc. Et so that should make it easy for those of you with an interest in other taxation areas too. Now the next thing we are going to talk about is the registration for sales tax on services with PRA. The first scenario is for those people who already have an NPM. Okay, remember this thing. When PRA was created, many people already had NTM, but a vast majority did not. So PRA had to create a system where it can account for both possibilities. And ideally it wanted to do it in such a manner that anybody coming to PRA to pay the tax, it would not need to refer them back to FPR. Some sort of a middle arrangement where the person can pay their taxes and meanwhile sort out the NTM issue. Since then, a lot of water has gone under the bridge. The systems have evolved. Registering for NTM has become exceptionally easier and comparatively much, much faster. Yes, there are still some snacks to be ironed out, but if you compare that to past practices, it's much better. So the option of non-registered, non-NTM holders which we will discuss after this section has slightly altered from what is being shown at the PRA website. So let's begin with this first, but before we go into this, 
I would like to quickly have any questions that you may have for anything that we have covered till now. We have to think of orange ones. Orange circle. Okay, orange circle. This one we have to look at. Okay, great. I don't think there are any questions. No. Okay, there are no questions. But so we are going to Okay, um, Harun Sab has just said you can write your questions and uh, we have the questions coming. Okay, uh, you have any question, please start writing. The first one is by Mardeep Ahmed. The sales texts on GERT are covered by FBR. Yes, Mardeep, they are. I'll wait for 30 seconds and if we don't have any other question, which means I may I have covered it very well. Then we'll move forward. Okay, seems like everything's good. So let's continue and get into the thick of things. Uh, let me open the PRA portal as well, so you guys can actually see what we are talking. About. pra.gov.bk hmm? It automatically redirects because initially the domain was pra.gov.bk so now they have a part of that one. Okay guys, how do we register? Well, we can go through the presentation and we certainly will, but I would like to show you how the things actually work. So this is the PRA website, the home page that you can see on your screens. You have home, all services, user guide, downloads, circular notifications, news. By the way, the circular notification section is extremely important because if during the financial year they want to amend anything, that is done by way of the circular clarification and notification. So it might be you are reading a certain thing within the act, but it has been altered during the course of the year and not yet fully updated and incorporated in the act. So you should, if you are working in taxation, keep an eye on this area. Just a quick handy tip. Okay, services. You can see you have these sections here, e-filing, e-registration, e-enrollment, and search of the taxpayers. So right now we want to register. So we'll begin with the first step. Registering yourself with PRA. You click on this e-registration tab and now you have three different options. The first one, if you are a new registration of someone having an NTN already. Uh, by the way, for those of you who are all together new to the area, NTN means national tax number. The second option is new registration for someone not having an NTN. And last but not the least, you can also check the status of an application for registration you have applied for. So we want to do the registration in the first scenario for someone having an existing NTN. We will click here. This will take you to this page. What you need to do is type an NTN here and what it would do is it basically would connect with the database of FBR and it will bring your details here which FBR holds for this NTN. Let me show you something. Okay, this is someone who is already registered. So it gives you the message, you are already in rural text where therefore you should go and log in onto the portal. But if you have someone who is not registered with the PRA, uh, well, just a quick idea. Does anyone want to get registered with PRA right now? We can do that for you for free right now. Okay, where did my orange area go? Okay. Okay. 
It's been done. It's been done. It's been done. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Wonderful. Wow. We have a lot of comments coming in now, uh, which we will answer in a bit. But right now, if you can just focus on this thing, anyone want to get registered with PRA right now? If you are an NTN holder and want to get registered with PRA for absolutely free, this is your time now. <laughs> just let me fix one more thing. Sure. These should be sorted in order of receipts. So now. Thank you. Thank you, Harun. Okay. Okay, so apparently we have some important, interesting questions coming up. Differences between e enrollment, e registration, criteria, technical services. We will be answering your questions in a bit. Let's first uh, get this thing done. Okay, let's go back to the website. Okay, guys, what you need to do is enter the NTN here, which is not registered. If it's for someone who is a sole proprietor, their CNIC would show here. If it's a corporate entity, only their name would show here. The name would show in any cases. So you can actually be certain that the details are correct here. Uh, the reference would go away. The image character is basically to ensure you are not a bot trying to hijack the website. You will write the image character here and press on the OK button. So once you do that, it would take you to the registration form. In the registration form, you will have your existing details with FPR already filled out, such as the name of your entity, your NTN number, your basic address, you are a resident. All these things would appear in the registry form and the registry part would be editable. For example, you have uh, changed any of your contact details, you can amend that. After ensuring that this first section holds your details correct, you will click on the save button. You will enter your details as to in what capacity are you filling this form. Are you the relevant person yourself? You are the business owner, you are the director, or are you an authorized representative, maybe a principal officer for the company, maybe a legal consultant, maybe a taxation consultant, maybe a company accountant. You have to fill that in the agent particulars under section 71. Then you will click, uh, click on the save registry button. If it's a corporate entity, you will enter the details of directors and shareholders. If you have any other business activity other than the core activity which you already provided to FPR when you registered for the NTN and which should be appearing, you will add the detail for that. You will also enter the detail for any business or branches if applicable. You will then add details of your bank account and then you will have a declaration saying all the information you have given is correct to your knowledge and belief. Uh, an official area at the bottom which show or would show uh, this is basically something PRA would work with. It would show the official ID that's been allocated your relevant uh, tax office. You will then click on the save button. You will click on verify, verify the application by providing your CNIC and NTN authorizing that you have filed this application and click on submit. Once you'll submit, you will receive the ID and password through an email and SMS. Just a quick word of caution, when you are doing that, please make sure you have an active email and phone number available and one that is not already being registered with PRA. Secondly, one that is accessible to you and thirdly, one which is confidential. Only you or your authorized people can access that. So that would be the registration. Once the registration is done, we then have to e-enroll in order to file the return. What is e-enrollment? How is that different from registration? We'll see that in a bit. First, let's just complete the process and also have a look what to do in case you don't have an NTN. Once you have completed this registration process, PRA will allocate you a PNTN 
which is basically for the ops NTN, which basically is your NTN with a P prefix, or sometimes not even that. Uh, activation and passcode will be sent separately uh, to both SMS and email. Activation code is sent to your SMS and passcode is sent to your email. You will then have to e-enroll, which we will see in the next section. But before that, as I said, what to do in case you are an existing NTN holder. Let's go back to BRA's website again. So this is PRA's website. This is where we landed when we tried to register for someone holding an NTN. Does it allow to register for someone who does not have an NTN? Let's find out. Yes, it does. Click on new registration having no NTN. Oops, the link is dead. Amar Bhai, did you click properly? Let's find out. See, I click again. The link is dead. And third time lucky, the link is still dead. What happened? Things changed. What I'm about to tell you is what the PRA is telling you. It's listed on their website and their material, etc. But after this, I will tell you how it actually works in practice now. So first, the conceptual thing, the legislation, followed by actual practical thing. So if you do not have an NTM or your client does not have an NTM but want to register with PRA, what should you do? You should go on the link that we just went, click on it, and apply for it. But since the link is already dead, what can you do? You should call the PRA helpline and apply manually. PRA will allocate you a provincial registration certificate and give you 30 days to get registered with FPR for NTN. You will enjoy the facilities, which mean you should be able to log in under the temporary registration and pay your taxes. Great. But if you do not get your NTN within 30 days, your registration will expire. So far, so good. But the link is not working. What do I actually do? Practically, you don't do that anymore. You go and apply for NTN, which hardly takes minutes now, depending on uh, if you are a sole proprietor or an individual, or even in the case of a company or corporate institution, if everything goes smoothly, if there is no snag, the system is working properly, it's not a peak season, you have done everything right, your documentation is complete, is done on the same day basis. So you do not effectively need this anymore, but it's still there. Since it's still there, for the sake of completeness, in line with our professional ethos, we have covered that, but in practice, you simply enroll for NTN and go back to option A. Okay, uh, what if you go for option A, enter your NTN number, it doesn't show your details. First thing you should do is check whether you have entered the proper NTN. Okay, the NTN is right, everything is right. Go back to FPR's website, double check it. Yeah, it's fine, it's showing there. It's in the database, but it's not showing there. What should I do? Don't panic. You would simply write an email to the support email I shared with you initially, esupport at pra.punjab.gov.pk and the pattern would be in the subject of email you would write at NTN in database and ideally in the bracket also write your NTN number. Then you will write in the email your NTN, your business name and the service category for which you are applying. You will send that email and you will follow that up in practice with calls. Uh, normally, they are very good and efficient and you do not need to visit their office, but you, if you really want it to be done quickly and uh, uh, you are in a rush, then I suggest you do visit their office as well. What will be the result? The support office will forward your application, they will reply you through email as it's done, and they will add your NTN in their database and retrieve file. Is it happening practically? Not anymore. Um, I think in hundreds of registrations that we have handled for PRA registration, we have never encountered that. 
but this is a possibility it can happen whenever whenever you are integrating IT systems they are teething issues so should you ever hit such a snap this is the way to do it. Okay, um, e-enrollment. Let's talk about that. What is e-enrollment? E-enrollment is basically giving you the access to your own user area or text member area or portal, whatever you are comfortable with, on PRA's website to file your return, to administer your record, to actually see how you have to pay your taxes. If you click on the services tab here, right under e-registration, you have e-enrollment. E-enrollment gives you two options, new enrollment or enrollment activation. We will cover them one by one. For new enrollment, you will click here. Basically, new enrollment is done in the case you were already registered for sales tax with that PR. Okay, I'm getting slightly confused, sir. What does it mean? You don't need to. Uh, and for those of you who are experienced, please bear with us because we have uh, an array, a beautiful array of Catholic. We have senior partners of firm, we have managing directors, we have head of finances, but we also have younger members. So we have to take everyone along. For those who are experienced, it would be a refreshing, right? Okay. So basically what happens is you might be registered for NTN, you might not be registered for NTN. Cover. You might be registered for sales tax. What do you do in that scenario? If you are registered for sales tax, you would go on e-enrollment activation. But if you were not registered for sales tax, you were only registered for uh, an NTN with FPR. You would register with uh, PRA first, and then you will apply for new enrollment. And what you would do is you will enter your NTN number here, and then you will enter the image characters. Okay, guys, anyone, uh, can anyone volunteer to provide their NTN number if they do not have an objection for that to be shared here? And I can quickly show you actually going in how the next stage will be done. So 30 seconds, very quickly, if you guys can provide an NTN. Anyone who would like to volunteer? Come on, guys, we have hundreds of you tuned in. One of you must surely have an NTN that can be shared. Okay, great. Farah Yunus, Sarmad Munir, Sarma. Wow, that was quick. Oh, Umar, and we have them coming up now. So I'll start with the first one that we got, and if need be, then we'll move on to the next one. Just like to write it here so we can. Four three eight double six nine three and check if it is zero. Thank you for us, Ahmed Umar, all of you. So we'll continue with the first one we received. Farah was the quickest. Ahmed, she beat you just like by a split second. Ahmed is sharing his nice number, so I don't think you should use it. Uh, Sarmat, uh, by the way, Arun rightly pointed out, I just noticed you have commented it's your clients. So ethically, unless you have taken a permission from them and they are comfortable, never do that. Okay. Okay, the NTN that is provided is already enrolled at PRA. You see this message up. Here, sorry, this NTN is already enrolled at PRA. Please, please proceed with uh, login using your user ID and password. Okay, so anybody else with a valid NTN number? You can share an I and he has no objection. That's fantastic then. 
So we'll move on to the one that Sermat shared. And I hope, Sermat, this one is not registered. Let's find out. Samarth, you are also registered. What are you guys doing? <laughs> you are providing NTNs which is which are registered. Okay, last one. Then we'll just move on. Number is different. Is that a CNIC number? Yeah, that's a CNIC number. Um, with regard to CNIC, um, FPR has reinstated mentioning the NTN number. If you go on FPR's website uh, using the search online taxpayer option you will see your NTN. So here you actually need to enter that NTN. PRA hasn't amended their system to incorporate the CNICs yet. And perhaps one of the reason they have to reincorporate FAR, the NTN and individuals. Okay, we will proceed with Saleh Kashif's now. Thanks Saleh. Let's see if this one is not registered. It was as if you were trying to check whether PRS system actually work and will detect whether you are registered or not. Okay. And Solis check digit is where is Solis? Solis. Okay. Zero. Okay. It's a personal NTN. So, I did nine four five three. Here you go. Uh, Saleh, you have probably already applied for e enrollment before coming into today's session. That's what PRA is telling us. So, Oops, we are registered, but you can use it to show your students as we learn. Uh, thanks, Sermon, but for that we need someone who is not registered. A registered person can't go into the registration process. And the returns, we already have these slides lined up for you of what goes inside the system. Okay, Emma Dawan will just try your one, and that would be the last one. Then we'll move on. Finally, we have someone who is not registered. Thank you, Emma Dawan. Okay, now what happened, as you can see on this screen, it has taken you to FPR's portal. What you would need to do is extremely simple now. You would enter your FPR login ID password here, press on login, and you will be in FPR's portal. Once you will enter FPR's portal, a checkbox would open and it would ask you, do you want and authorize us to transfer your details to BRA? You would click on an affirmative. Yes, you would authorize. That's it. Simple as anything. You would do that, done. You would log out, you will log in back uh, at PRA's website. So what will happen? Once you will enter on the FPR's website, you will confirm to transfer your particulars to FPR, uh, from FPR to PRA. By the way, transfer means only copying details. It does not mean that your record from FPR will be deleted. Of course, not at all. NTN income tax are still administered by FPR. It's only the sales tax on services within Punjab that's being administered by PRA. So you will go back uh, to PRA's website and you will receive something referred to as a passcode and activation code. The passcode will be sent to you on email and activation code on mobile number. You would enter that and your enrollment will be active. You would receive your 
email uh, you would receive your new password and pin in the email you would enter that detail and log in i will show you how we will log in just in a bit when we will go into the return file meanwhile just to complete that e enrollment activation now this activation work in two ways number one we have done new in e enrollment we have authorized on fpr's portal and it has told us now that it's done you can go back to pra and log in but before you log in you have to activate that how would you activate that let me show you and while i'm at it let me also tell you the second scenario in which you will use the e enrollment activation that is that you already are registered for sales tax with fpr and you already tried to enroll in the initial system of pr you would still use the activation of e enrollment in that case so how does it work and this is something you should pay attention to because many people say sir umar we applied for enrollment it didn't work then they are not saying wrong they did apply they just never went back to activate it. so uh, i know it's kind of a tricky two step process but that's the way it is you need to go back and activate the e enrollment in order to be assigned the id and password and enter in the system so again you'll go back on the services tab you will click on e enrollment you would click now instead of new enrollment on enrollment activation here you will enter your pntn which should have been emailed to you by now as per theory and as per material on prs website what actually happens is most of the cases you don't you simply enter your ntn and that works your ntn serves as your pntn but what do happen is that you receive an activation code in the form of an sms on the cell number that you have provided you need to enter that here then you also receive a second check a passcode which is only sent on your email that you have provided you have to enter that here and then you enter the image correct characters and simply press submit nice and easy done your e enrollment is now active you are now able to log in within the members area within the portal within your specific area you would receive your email and pin to log in and what would be your id your pntn which is basically your ntn number you would use that to log in so so far so good uh, we have covered the basic registration both in the cases of you having an ntn you don't have an ntn we have also covered about new enrollment and enrollment activation we have also discussed the scenario where you are registered for sales tax and we will now be moving into the actual crux that we would like to focus on the actual filing of sales tax return and just to give you a taste of what just to come uh, since i knew we might not have people uh, willing to share their details we have these slides available for you showing you what actually went and goes inside the member area what the actual return look like how do you file that what are the various steps involved we will be going through that in a bit but before that if you have any questions now is the time so we had some question let's start answering them and meanwhile you can ask any question you have or anything we have covered till now assalamu alaikum all acca team we will have a good experience sure thanks sir mr adnan uh, it's been shared okay only services are covered by pra already answered mateeb yes only services actually not services sales tax on services within the embed of punjab asif nur khan what is the criteria for compulsory sale register tax registration well asim this was covered or is supposed to covered within uh, the session on sales tax on services act in punjab it's not directly relevant but i'll quickly answer you if you are providing a service in punjab you are supposed to get registered with pra full stop 
it doesn't work like uh, FPR. If you are a widow, if you are a this, you don't get registered. If it's under this threshold, if you are providing taxable service in Punjab, if you are providing any service, you get registered. If you are providing taxable service, there is no excuse. Get registered. Marriages is a fee for technical services charged by the parent company of branch office covered by PRA. Again, Umair, it's not relevant, but I'll answer you in one word. Yes, Adnan Khan. What is the difference between e-enrollment, e-registration, and e-filing? I believe, Adnan, we have covered the first two, and the third one I'll show you just in a bit. Uh, Adnan, again, how is e-registration different from e-enrollment? As you have seen, Adnan, e-registration is basically applying to FPR, getting registered with them. E-enrollment is actually gaining access to their web portal to file your return to administer your taxation affairs. But finally, previously telecom services were sale, sale tax, under sales tax, I believe that's what you mean. Now it is under PRA. Will it be a double taxation? Actually, that's a brilliant question, Irfan. Um, ACCA has done a detailed study on provincial harmonization, which I was honored to be a part of it, and we have covered that, this particular area of impact. Uh, the problem is this, how do you categorize telecom? The taxpayer often end up with a situation where FPR is insisting that a particular telecom related business is in nature provision of goods because vast majority is provision of goods. But PRA on the other hand claim it's a service because vast majority is provision of service. So yeah, we do end up with situations where you have to clarify and actually have to contest your case to prove it's a good or a service and it's one of the harmonization issues that we have been experiencing, the taxpayer, the professional, post the 18 amendment. Uh, but yet, Telecom is now covered within the embed of PSTSA, Punjab Sales Tax on Services Act. Uh, slightly different rate than the rest, 19.5%, uh, I believe. Next one, Sayyid Arsalan Gelani. Can we change the basic details like address, etc., online? Without the need to visit any office, you can send an email at non to the support email uh, that sh I shared with you. They normally ask you to provide them uh, copies, often certified copies of certain documents. Um, if you are a corporate entity, they might ask you to visit their office. Normally, they don't do. Okay, um, quick word of appreciation to those who provided their NTN for us, Sarmad, Omer, Saleh. Uh, Hubab, Adnan, all of you, thank you. I'm on the one. Okay, uh, Umar Ijaz, Abed Ashraf. Next one, and finally, what is the difference between uh, e-registration, e-enrollment, answered? Adnan Khan, will e-enrollment, new enrollment work if someone has not registered with PRA? Uh, if you are not registered with PRA, now they have a system where they have linked themselves with the FPR. So most of the time they are able to get the data there. But it is not advisable. You should do it the proper way or lest you be faced with a situation where it's taking seven days with the support to actually sort out the issue. Hardly takes like a couple of minutes. So go to the proper route. Next one, Omer Ejaz. Can we register if we don't provide any services for future? Uh, if you don't provide any services, what would you mention in the services area? The service you want to provide in future. Uh, you are not supposed to do that, but there is nothing really stopping you from doing it. But then you would have the responsibility to keep records, to file your returns monthly. So if you are happy with doing that, go ahead, why not? Uh, by the way, people do register in advance, but that's not like a lot in advance. It's normally a week, two weeks, maybe a month in advance before they want to start the business that they get registered. Beyond that, you want to do that, uh, nothing there to stop you, but just remember the administrative uh, cost in your mind. 
Imdad was said, hello, can you go through and talking about the process of how to register to get an NTA? Okay, uh, there is a smile on Aaron's face. Um, okay, Imdad, it's not within today's session, but let me tell you what I do. If we get some spare time at the end of the session, I will show you. Okay? If you don't get some time, I will be sharing my contact details. Shoot me an email or give me a call. I will get you. Okay? The recordings are also there, but your recordings from 2016, 15, 17, all the recordings. Have we covered NTN registration in that? I think yes, registering quite is amazing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Imdad, if you go on Vimeo, ACCS channel on Vimeo, and I believe also on YouTube, you will file, uh, find these sessions on uh, registering and filing and revising for income tax return. And we have covered in those recordings how to register for NTA. The process is largely similar. For companies, it has slightly been altered. So for that, just contact me later on and I'll guide you. Okay, next one, Adnan Khan. This new enrollment is an alternate way to register with PRA rather than getting directly registered. No, Adnan, it's not e-enrollment is getting access to their website. E-registering is the proper way of actually getting registered with them in their taxation records. Omer, thank you very much. You're welcome. And finally, if we have registered for four services, can we add services later on? Yes, you can, Irfan. Within your member area, you have the option to apply for amendment and add additional services. So if you plan to offer additional services in the future, you can do that. Nothing stopping you. That's it. Any more questions? No. Uh, should we take a quick break now? 7.30? OK. Chill a little. Okay, we will have a quick uh, break at half past 11 for 15 minutes. Let's continue into the major area, the actual filing of sales tax return. How many of you have uh, ever filed a sales tax return with PRA before? Well, I'll assume at least some of you, if not a majority. Uh, the process has evolved over years. Just recently, PRA has amended the process and their return pattern for September 2017 returns onwards. So if uh, you have started after that, you don't know what was done before, no issue, we'll show you. If you knew what was done before, don't know what's happening now, no problem, we'll show you. First things first, let's again go back to PRA's website. There's no replacement for the real thing, is there? Again, PRA's website, you have two ways. Click on this blue line for all e-services. It would take you to the login page. Or click on e-filing under services and new e-filing. It would take you to the same page. Now, you have this login area where you'll enter your user ID, which is your ENTN and the password which was sent to you or if you change it, the one you change it to. You will click on login. If you forgot your password, you will click on this option, provide a user ID and reset that. Once you have done that, you will be inside the member area. Once you are in for the first time, a declaration would open which you'll click on for OK. And what you'll do next is, you'll go on top. Here you can see this declaration area. You'll click on that and a drop down menu would come, which would say sales tax. You would click on that and a drop down menu would come, which would offer you the offer to go for sales tax return for tax period 2000, September 2017 and onwards, or sales tax on services return. The second option, sales tax on services return, is for periods before September 2017. So if you have some old outstanding returns or a client comes to you who hasn't filed sales tax return for some period now and wants you to file, that is the option you would go to. For current and present scenario and henceforth, you would 
click on the top option sales tax return for tax period September 2017 onwards. Once you'll click on the that, it would take you to this page where you should be able to see on your screen. This is how the PRS sales tax return would look to you. Uh, you, if you notice, you have that small notepad thing coming in front of you. That is just to uh, protect the client privilege. Obviously, uh, privacy is uh, paramount. We don't want their taxation details to be shared. But I really wanted to show you what goes on inside. So that is a middle ground that we reached. If you look on your left side, you have the tax period right here, monthly. There would be this drop down menu would be active when you would be doing the real deal and you would have the period September 2017, October 2017, after this month ends, November 2017 and so on and so on. You would click on the relevant month that you want to file for. Okay. Um, the first thing you would do even before that is you click on this sales tax on services return and this area opens, then you click on month and you select the relevant month. Now if you look at the return, it has three distinct columns. Description, the value and the sales tax amount. The first item is the domestic purchases excluding fixed assets for providing of services. So, this thing you should have covered and you are assumed to know, but I'll just quickly tell you. For sales tax on services in Punjab, the relevant input adjustment on the purchase side is only for something that is directly linked to providing the services. So for example, if you bought some uh, office furniture and you want to put that in here, no, you can't do that. That is not allowable in this section. Or if you have a business, more like a conglomerate, where let's say you are providing some services and you are also um, providing goods along with that, and you bought something which is related to the goods area of the business, no, you can't put that here. So the idea is you will exclusively put purchases, excluding any fixed assets, which are directly linked to your core business, the supply of the services that you are claiming. Though it can be the multiple supplies in case you are enrolled and registered for more than one service area. I would show you, I, what I'm going to do is first run down through these individually, then I would show you the annexures and how would you fill this return. So the second item, if you look at it, is in quotes excluding fixed assets. The first item, domestic purchases. Second item, your imports. The third item are your capital and fixed assets, which you have to disclose. Then you have non-credible, uh, creditable inputs. Any item related to exempt or non-tax supplies, they are not allowed to be credit, uh, credited, but you have to disclose them here. The, uh, then you have this column number five, which is calculated for you automatically. What it does is, it adds up the domestic purchases figure, the import figure, the capital fixed asset figure, and the non-creditable input figure is actually deducted. So any tax on those items is deducted. Now, if you say why, you have to go back to the session on Punjab uh, sales tax on services. I think we covered that last year too. Uh, the recording is available on Vimeo and YouTube channels. Uh, just very quickly, I'll give you the idea if you are coming to a session for the first time. It's because the taxation laws prohibit to claim for non-creditable items. The idea is this, if the item was exempt and you are taking the benefit of that against the taxable supply, you are actually uh, getting one up and you are ending up with treasury losing the money. So the law doesn't allow you that, you have to follow the law. Uh, item number six is the credit carried forward from previous tax periods. This is determined by the department where applicable. You also have your records. If you are doing any everything by the book, they should tell you with the department record. 
you enter the figure there. Then you have sales tax withheld by the buyer as a withholding agent. So what's happening is when you are doing a transaction, be it that you are the seller or the buyer, there is a portion that you have to withheld. The details again are provided in the act and the rules. So you have to give details of the text withheld by the buyers here. We will look at an extra C in detail just in a moment. Uh, meanwhile, you have 7A, 7B, 7C, which basically are the allowances uh, and balance of earlier disallowed input tax credit. You then have nine, uh, if you look at the screen, nine, which is the second last item. Uh, and uh, it's 9A and 9B, both of these would be derived from the data you would provide in an XGRC. So in 9, we would be looking at services provided and rendered, and in 9B, we would be looking at services provided and rendered for any exempt sales. So what the return is doing, it's bifurcating between those sales that were taxable supplies and those which were exempt. Uh, I assume you have the basic knowledge, but I'll very quickly cover for those who haven't attended the previous taxation sessions. The supplies can be taxable. A taxable supply can, in theory, be zero rated, which is not the case right now, or it can be standard rated, 16%, 99.5% as applicable. Or it can be an exempt supply that no tax is applicable on that. So for exempt supply, a separate disclosure is required because the tax treatment is different, as you'll see in a bit. Which brings us to the next area. By the way, uh, the return was uh, a bit lengthy, so we have to cut it down on three screens to cover all the areas. But this is essentially the same return. In the real area, real taxation individual member individual taxpayer taxation area, you simply scroll it down and you see this thing. So on this screen, the upper portion of uh, sales tax debits is repeated, 9A, 9B. Then 10 is the services exported. Uh, we did discuss that initially the sales tax was limited, used to be limited to domestic supplies and goods, then it was expanded to imports and export, and you have seen in the upper area that we covered in the last screen on sales tax credits that beside domestic purchases, the imports was all, were also covered. So the same concept has been applied here. In the debits, beside the local sales, the exports are also covered. Then you have 11, which is the final figure, the output tax for the month. So does the return ends there? Not yet. We will move on to 12. Now the next area is uh, for payable or refundable area. Number 12 is the input for the month admissible under the rules. The formula is that three plus six are added and admissible inputs of one and two are added and four is subtracted, which we just covered before four were the exempted, non-creditable items, exempted and otherwise not allowable. We just covered that on the last screen. I'll show you. This is this is what we covered, right? So uh, next step is available balance, credit or debit. Then you have item number serial number fourteen. Do you want to carry forward the input of capital and or fixed assets declared as serial number three? If you want to carry forward, you would enter yes, and appropriate adjustments would be made. If you don't want to carry it forward, you want to get done and dusted with it in this financial period, you'll click on yes. Where was it? Just on the last screen, you can see it here. Uh, there you have it, item number three. Capital fixed assets, domestic purchases and imports, all together, right? Okay. So now you have told in the final adjustment area whether you want it to accrue in this period or carry it forward. If you notice, the return is going very logically. First, they have the sales tax credits, the purchases you made, the imports you have done, uh, what is the position, any exempt supplies, non-allowable credits. Then they have the sales tax debits. 
the sales that you have made domestically, any exempt item sales that you have made, any exports that you have done, uh, work that out, what's the net balance of input and output. And now you are working out the final area, adding them all together, applying the relevant areas of the legislation, working out what will be your final tax liability in terms of sales tax on services for PRA. So uh, moving forward, um, serial number 50, sales tax will held by the return filer as a withholding agent. So the sales tax that you have withheld as a withholding agent. Again, uh, this is something that is linked up with, uh, that's something which is again linked up with the coverage of the act and the rules. Uh, if you want to have a first hand knowledge of that, you can go on Vimeo, uh, ACC channel of Vimeo has an array of these recordings. Uh, you can also go on, um, YouTube, if you are more comfortable with YouTube, uh, ACC also have videos, but videos from last year haven't yet been updated on the YouTube channel. So you can search that. Uh, I also have those videos copied on my channel, which is by my name. So do go watch those. They would be very helpful. You should be aware how the legislation work in order to have a proper understanding and grasp of how to file the return. Otherwise, you can fill up the number, but you wouldn't really know what's going on here. That can still be a confusion for you. So coming back to the point, you have to enter here the sales tax that you have withheld. Uh, I told you before that uh, on both sides, the legislation mentions the amount of sales tax that has to be withheld. So for example, if you are doing a transaction with someone, you are supposed to withhold a certain proportion depending on who you are doing the transaction and which area it is. Uh, in a worst case scenario, if you are dealing with someone who is non-registered and blacklisted, you have to withhold 100% of the sales tax. So any and all amount of sales tax that you have withheld, you would enter here in serial number 50. How would you enter here? That's coming from a mixture A, which if you have a look here, we already filled out. So all these figures are coming from that annexure. Uh, similarly, we can also see that a lot of figures are derived from what we filled in annexure C. And if we have any export oriented services, we have to fill in the annexure D. Good news for you, we will be covering all these annexures. Let's move forward. If you have any tax reverse charge as per the information provided in an extra A and C, what is a tax reverse charge? Well, I do know some of you attended these sessions and even my sessions from last year. So very quickly, within a minute, any one of you would like to tell me what is a tax reverse charge we are talking about here? Come on quickly. Okay, we have a lot of questions coming in. That's good. Uh, we will answer that in a bit, but very quickly. Has any of you attended these sessions on uh, Sales Tax Act, uh, Sales Tax Rules? Anyone? Okay, good. We have an answer from Kasim Kasim. Tax reverse charge is the tax already paid. Um, Good attempt, Kasim. You need to elaborate a bit more. And anyone else? Come on, guys. We have hundreds of you. Just one guy answering it. Okay, you know what? If your answer is wrong, I wouldn't call out your name. Now you can freely type in your comments there. Okay, um, we have a time limitation, so I'm afraid I can't wait anymore. I would have to move on. Text reverse charge is basically uh, 
Arun Rashid says text already charged in previous month. Yeah, there are two ways. The most common text reverse charge is you applied for some text benefit the previous month for a purchase or something or for a sale and that is reversed. Maybe a sale is returned or maybe you returned a purchase. So the transaction is returned. So whenever a transaction is returned and the net impact is that the tax saving, the tax benefit that was accrued to you is reversed. That is referred to as a tax charge reverse. Okay. It can also be the other situation. It can both be on the sales side and the purchase side. So yeah, essentially Kasim and Harun, you are right. Something you have already accounted for that has reversed now. The transaction has been reversed. You made a sale, you have returned the, uh, you have been returned the goods to. You made a purchase, you have returned the goods. Make that adjustment here. Great. Next up, you move on to uh, serial number 17, sales tax payable formulas. Then you have refund claim, if any. Then you have credit to be carried. Then end of year refund claim. Then you have net credit carried forward. Then you have in 22 any penalties, any default surcharges. By the way, the legislation provides for penalties and default surcharges. Uh, there are also penalties for late filing of return. But since PRA is still in an evolution phase, one thing that they are doing good is if you are not filing your return timely, they send you a reminder. They do not immediately penalize you as of now. And you are supposed to get your house in order, start filing your returns on time. So while this is something that uh, we can get lazy around, okay, what's the big deal? Uh, it's one day or two day to remember. As per legis legislation, you can be fine. It's just the good people of PRA are not filing you at the moment. Doesn't mean they will not always be. So try to get into the habit of filing by time period. Um, we have already shared that text period card, text uh, card with you with list relevant dates. So that should be handy. Take a printout, put in your working area. That would always serve as a reminder. Okay, next up, after the fine default surcharges, uh, if there are any areas in 24, if there's any specific penalty or fine for this period in 25, then we have 26, which add up the total amount, and uh, that's pretty much it. It just takes us to the last segment of the return. Where you basically, uh, if you look at, we already covered till 26, 27 is text paid on normal and previous return. Texas you have already paid, then you have 28, which is the balance text payable, and you have 29, you have to select the account uh, from, uh, for in which you want to receive a refund. So you will click on the scroll down menu and select the account. Normally people only add one account, but there is no limitation. You can add more than one account too. So then you can see you would have our advice payable. Uh, all these fields which are appearing as yellow here and in the rest of the return, that's why I was quickly running through them, would be automatically calculated. You do not enter any number here. Where do you enter the number? The fields that are appearing to be white. For example, on this, you enter in 23A, default surcharge, 24B, areas, 25C, penalty fine, 27, tax paid on normal, previous return, applicable in case of amended return. That's it. What? Server, that means we are only entering 3, 4 number? Where does an extra A come from? Where does an extra C, an extra D? You do not enter here on the front of the return but you do fill out the mixture. That's where the rest of the data will come from. The return would automatically grab the relevant figure from the mixture, compute those figure, apply the relevant laws, and calculate the figure for you. So let's go into the thick of things, start with an mixture A. Let's click on an mixture A, and that should take us to here. This is an mixture A in front of you now. Oops. 
I stop missed to put out this here. Their details are visible. Okay, all you good people, I request you to please, after consulting with the presentation, delete this one slide. It's not ethical. Although I did ask the client if their name can be shown, they were fine, but somehow my staff missed putting out something in front of the NTN. Anyway, so uh, this is Annexure A. Annexure A is basically a summary of domestic purchase. What you have to do is, all the domestic purchases need to be entered here. There are two ways of doing that. One is manually, you use the system and enter each and every detail individually, as I will show you in a bit right now. Or second, you will move to this attach file option, and you will attach an Excel file drawn in the performa here. You will make an Excel file as per this performa, and you will simply enter your data in that Excel file, and then you would attach that. So whatever you prefer. Some people, because they have data in the Excel file, but they want to double check, they prefer to enter it individually. But it is more time consuming. You are entering each and every detail again and individually. Some people say, okay, I've already entered in Excel. I've checked that. It's all fine. They straight away go onto this attach file. Uh, there has been a recent trend in some of our younger members. Um, they don't make any Excel file. They just look at the data and start entering individual details. Nothing wrong with it technically, but it is a risky approach. You are missing out on controls. You do not have a complete list there to check it against. Uh, if you miss out any individual invoice, it is harder to trace that back. And all the data you are entering, you do not have a comprehensive immediate benchmark to check the invoices against. So what I will advise you is uh, make it a habit to enter all the invoices detail into an Excel file first. Uh, enter into the <coughs> sorry Excel file first. Then in that way you can have a check, a control and balance, and avoid the errors. Then it's up to you whether you want to attach file or whether you just want to enter the data. So if you look here. You have to enter the NTN and or oblique or CNIC, depending on whether the one you were dealing with, your supplier was a corporate entity, sole proprietor partnership, their name would automatically come here from the database. Then next, you will select the document type, whether this was a purchase invoice, this was what? You, normally, it's the purchase invoice. I've selected that for you. Uh, I've already entered here. You will enter the invoice number. Then you will enter the document date in the format days, like today is 18 11 2017. Then we have HS code. HS code is basically uh, that code that I've showed you in the first schedule for several different services, and that's in the second schedule too. HS code is basically from the customs codes. So here you see, for example, uh, what you bought are services provided by clubs. So you will enter this code there, right? Cool. Now you know what it is. Let's go back. After the HS code, purchase type. What did you purchase? Services. What was the rate? It was not telecom services. The general rate is 16%. Where would you get the rates? I will show you in a bit. Just a hint for those of you who don't know. Second schedule and any circulars and notifications. So sales tax invoice uh, would be the figure that would automatically come here. You would enter the amount of sales tax you have withheld. Any non-creditable inputs, if there were any, and the reason why they were non-creditable, if they are any. Once you have entered that data, then you will add that by clicking on the purchase data and you would do that for all the invoices and then you would go back to return. So what I suggest is that you create an Excel file in the same format, enter all these details there, simply click on the attach file and add that file here and then 
you would be in a much better place. You would save your time. You would have checked your accuracy, and you would have this an extra filled out for you. Once you have done that, then you go back to the return again. Okay. Uh, but before we go there, you can see there's this tab of purchase data. What would happen if I click on this? Let's find out. This is what would happen. This window will open in front of you where you can see all the data that you can search, whether you have entered some transaction already or not. You want to double check. You can also check here. It would be appearing here, the list. But if you are still in the process or maybe you have a lot of data or maybe um, for any reason you want to check or maybe you want to check whether a transaction was charged in the previous month or not. You can click on the purchase data and you can enter the relevant period, select the dates you want to search in, enter the relevant date and you can search that particular invoice. So in a simple um, way if I want to put it what it is, it's a search option for you to search the purchase data. Uh, okay, I can see it's the break time now. In fact, we are almost 10 minutes past the break time. So why don't you guys go over to what we have covered till now and uh, let's have a quick uh, 15, minute, 15 minutes break and I'll see you all back in uh, 15 minutes and show. Thank you. Okay guys, assalamu alaikum and welcome back. Apologies, it took slightly longer, uh, but the good thing is you would all be feeling fresh after that break, I believe. Okay, great. Let's uh, continue with the questions. We'll continue with the session. I'll first start uh, by answering your questions. We'll then move on to the presentation and continue where we left from. Do you remember? We were at data search option, invoice data, purchase data to be precise. Okay, and that was within an actual A. Yeah. Mm, questions, questions, questions. Okay, Mtad Umer. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I file for terms. Okay, Faisal Muzaffar asked, can the images be zoomed a bit, please? Uh, Faisal, uh, if you joined late, and for the rest of you, all the relevant material, including presentation, has been shared in the handout section. So you can download that and open at your screen and adjust the size to whatever level is most comfortable to you. Next, Abdul Rakib, dear sir, I'm attending lecture for the first time. Can the previous lectures be emailed to me? Abdul Rakib, as we have shared, the recordings of all the sessions are available on ACCS channel on Vimeo. They are also available on YouTube. So you can go to them. And if you still need something, you can always get back to us. Mati Behman. The sales text with wording statement is entered separately or entered in this statement also. Well, the amount of sales text withheld is mentioned here. The withholding statement concept as an FPR is for the withholding statements that are filed separately. Here you are mentioning the withholding text that you have withheld in this return area that we have seen. Okay, Ahmad Awan, does sales tax relevant to admin expenses can be claimed? Example like for IT distributors, sales tax on fuel for official vehicle can be claimed or not. If that was directly for the deliverance of the services and you can justify, yes you can. Next up, Abdul Rakib is uh, asking, Output text for the month, is this text related to services or good? 
Abdul Rakeem, output text can both be related to services and words, but right now we are discussing sales text on services, so our focus is on services. Any goods you purchase to provide services, you have to check whether they are allowable. If they are, yes, you can claim for that. Other than that, no, you file for sales tax on goods with FPR. And finally, what is the rate of uh, withhold the tax in PRA? Example, 20% in GST. Yeah, that's a rule of thumb, Irfan. Uh, Mostly on average, it's 20%, but it varies. Um, again, go through the lectures on uh, Punjab Sales Tax on Services Act. Punjab Sales Tax on Services Act, go through them. Uh, my lectures are also available on uh, YouTube, ACCS channel on Buy Me or After videos. So go through them. If you still have any confusion, uh, just feel free to get back to me. Kasim asked us, uh, X reverse charges the tax already paid here. Yeah. Arun, uh, Maryam Hafiz is asking, can you please tell the name by which video on PRA sales tax is available on YouTube? Okay, it's uh, Punjab Sales Tax on Services Act 2012. The alternate way is uh, on Vimeo, they have all the lectures on YouTube. The channel was open later on and it's still in a shifting process. So uh, what they are going to do is, uh, uh, they are going to shift that. So what you can do is, uh, meanwhile, if you don't find it on YouTube, go on my channel. That is with my name, Omar Zaheer Me. You would have all those ACCA previous lectures on taxation by me there. So Punjab Sales Tax on Services Act 2012. That it is, Marie. Jangir, hi. Hello, Jangir. Um, Jangir Ali is, when will next session start? Yeah, it started. You are tuned in. Omar Ajaz, welcome back, sir. Thank you. Chaudhry Fezan Khalik. Sir, does PRA only deal only with services, sales tax, and not for manufacturing business? Uh, that's why, Fezan, I think you probably would have joined late in the session because that's what we discussed initially. PRA deals with sales tax on services within the ambit of Punjab. Mati Bamat, sales tax withholding statement, also submitted at FPR. Uh, that is for sales tax administered by FPR, which is sales tax on goods primarily. Uh, Abdul Raza, thank you. Zishan Rashid, no audio. Uh, you should be able to hear Zishan. Um, everyone else seemed to be able to listen. Are you guys able to listen to me? There's nothing appearing here on the portal indicating any turbulence. So I'm assuming it should be fine. Yes, we can hear. So Zishan, it has to be something at your end. Probably check your headphone. Uh, try taking that out, adjusting your sound volume. OK. Any other questions? I think all the questions have been answered. So let's move forward. Let's continue from where we left. OK, guys. Now, if you look at your screen, you can see where we left from. This is the purchase data for those who join later. And just to refresh after the break. Here, uh, this was an extra A. And in an extra A, we had this option of purchase data, which we were exploring just with, before the break. We have this search option to see the data and all. And after this, Just bear with me. Okay, uh, what happens with PRA is whenever you do a transaction, a transaction can be on any side. Maybe you sold something, some services, 
or you pour some services. So whenever that is done, whether you are filing the return, the other person is filing the return, the invoices are supposed to come here. How are they supposed to come here when you are about to file the return, right? Because you file the mixture as per the text calendar, you make the payment earlier for which you have to do the basic calculations. And how can you do the calculations if you don't have the basic structure? So what happened is whenever a registered taxpayer is doing the transaction, they are going within the database of PRA. Now there was a problem with this that at times you have entered your relevant invoices. The other person has not entered their relevant invoices. So you are stuck with the problem. How can you select the invoices? How can you add the invoices? For example, um, you purchase some services from XYZ Limited. You are filing your return. You went in the purchase data and you can't file their invoice. The problem is if you can't find, find their invoice before, it couldn't be verified. Basically, the concept came from the Strive sales tax real-time invoice monitoring verification system that FPR launched. The idea was that both end should be reconciled real time. If a seller is claiming a rebate that I purchased these items from someone, then the one who sold to that person should also be connected with that so that their return can be verified and the chances of tax fraud or omission would be minimized. The problem with that was the timing. How would you make sure that two taxpayers file the return at the same time who have dealt with each other. It might be one taxpayer is taking an invoice to the next tax period. It might be that they haven't just filed the return yet. For that, from sep uh, in fact not even September, um, the notification was allowed yesterday. You have also been allowed now to enter those invoices and claim credit for that. And in the next period, when uh, or after a few days, when your counterparty will file their return, that would be matched with this transaction. What would happen if nobody would file a relevant transaction? Well, that's where PR is audit come into play. The thing that they have launched this year is the new concept of auditing the returns to find out these discrepancies. Anyway, going back. What you are looking at right now is we were at an extra A and now we are at an extra B. So just for you to avoid the confusion, what would actually happen is once you click on this go back to return, you'll come back to this main return. You have filled up your an extra A with all the invoices data. This system of PRA will automatically add that up and show you the total value and the sales tax amount. It would also drive the relevant data for elsewhere and put in the figures there for you automatically. You don't have to fill any of these yellow fields. You just have to fill the white fields and your annexures. Okay, now we will click on annexure B. And next year B is related to, as you can see, your import data. So let's go on to our next year B. Sorry about that. I really wanted it to be a real-time uh, example, but um, all the clients are extremely sensitive about their data being shared. So unless one of you can volunteer and I can show around the actual data, otherwise. What we have done is the next big, uh, best thing that we could come up with, actually show you the real return and tell you how that has filled up with. So if any of you have uh, some client data who are perfectly comfortable with sharing the return, showing all their data, please let me know. Okay, this is regarding the import data. Not every client of yours would be doing import. In fact, the vast majority of them would not be doing 
So this won't be needed to be filled for each and every one of your clients. Uh, most of the clients who are only dealing domestically or at least all their purchases are domestically, you would just leave an extra B out blank. For those who are actually importing, you would come here and you would attach your import data file. Again, you would have the file in the Excel format. Basic IT stuff, you are very used to it, how to attach, I'm sure you attach your emails. If you want to see how the file should be created, you can click here and download the sample file. You would basically give out the details of the imports that you have done and the relevant taxes and values on that. Then you can either go back to an extra A if you want to amend that, or you can go back to return. Uh, we are assuming our NX today was fine. We'll click on here and we go back to our return homepage again. So once we have come to the return, we can go to an extra C. Here, you'll click on this and you'll reach the NX C. But before going into an extra C, I would like to show you something else. Do you remember in the domestic purchases we had the purchase data, right? Where we could uh, just check the data, the counterpart invoices that we are entering, whether they are already available in the system or not, right? Here you have the import data. What does the import data option do? Quite similar. People often get confused. Oh, what is import data? It's nothing complicated. It's pretty much the same thing as the purchase data, only instead of domestic purchases, this is for imports. You click on this import data fit in, uh, sorry, import data tab to get this section. What this section outlines is the entire data of your import GDs, the goods declaration. People used to imports would understand the terminology. For those who are not very familiar with import terminology, GD is basically the good declaration. When you import some good, it's the document that is accompanied with your good. It outlines what you have imported, what is the value you have declared, what is the quantity, what is the sales tax you have paid at the import stage, any federal excise duty, any other additional taxes, etc. All of that is outlined in your GD. So your GD is basically entered in the system and that is connected here. So when you are entering your import uh, GDs and data, what you are going to do is in an extra B, you can attach your file and just to verify whatever you are entering here is available, you can click on import data and you will have all the relevant GD information. And here you would have the bifurcation of sales tax at import stage, taxable value, federal ad, excise duty paid, all of these categorized according to commercial exempt, fixed asset, etc. etc. Again, once you are done with it, you again have the option to save. You have entered your data, you have checked the import. G, uh, good declarations that you have that they have been properly entered you can now click on save or if you see certain GDs as per your name which you don't think are yours which you think are probably an error you want to rectify you can delete or you can simply save and go back to return once you click on go back to return again you'll come back here and then where would we go the next logical stop an extra C here is an extra C for you. An extra C is our last major annexure. Yeah. Okay. I hope you are all able to see an extra C here. First of all, you can see on the top, an extra C is for domestic sales invoices. First of all, you'll select the buyer type. Who was the buyer? Was it the end consumer or just an intermediary? Normally most of the sales are done to intermediaries unless you are working with a retail client, in which case it's the end consumer mostly. So you'll select, we are assuming, let's assume for this transaction it was an intermediary. I'll select that. You'll enter the NTN 
if they are a corporate entity, CNIC, if they were an individual, their name would automatically appear. You select the document type. Normally, the sales invoice is the standard one. Again, similar to what we did in an XJA, you'll enter the document date, the HS code. You remember where to get the HS codes from. I showed you the first schedule. Basically, they are uh, the custom codes and they have been incorporated. They are used to identify the items in the system. Then you'll uh, select the sales type. Again, here the drop down menu will give you the option. Uh, we are dealing with Punjab sales tax on services. So, bulk of the stuff that you would encounter would be services. At times, there would be goods which you would need in order to deliver the services. If such is the case, you can select that from here. We are assuming services for this, then you select that. Then, what is the standard rate? Uh, that was uh, applicable. Let's assume on this one it was whatever you can select. I've just selected this 5% for this particular example. District of the buyer, I sold to SIM, but the select that could be Lahore, wherever you are selling. Uh, it gives you a listing in this drop down menu of all the major towns uh, of Pakistan. You can select them. Then you'll enter the value. The sales tax invoice would be entered. If there is any tax which is reverse charged under section 4, you have to enter that here. And the amount of GST that you have withheld, you can enter that here. Okay. Uh, now, all of this should be added in an Excel file if you want to. And you can simply attach the file. If you want to do it here, you enter that and you submit the invoice. And that becomes part of the system. Uh, it gives you a bifurcation in the end, which you can see. It categorizes for each category the value and sales tax as per all the invoices that you have sub uh, submitted. Goods sold to end consumer to intermediary, services provided to end consumer and intermediary, and the exempt sales, and then the gross total for all those areas. So far, so good. Next up. Next up is your annexure D. Okay, uh, just for sake of completeness, you can click on here, go back to return. You'll again come back here to the return. Now we have done annexure A, annexure B, annexure C. So logically, our last major annexure, annexure D, is the one that we would click on. And as you can see here, annexure D deals with services exported. So an extra A, domestic purchases. An extra B, imports. An extra C, domestic sales. An extra D, exports. Logical order. In an extra D, which deals with any services that you have exported, you can see the options you have. Which system did you use? Did you use one custom or did you use uh, tax care system or did you use VIPA? For those of you who are not familiar with these terms, they are, these are basically the custom processing system. The one most commonly used now is VIPA. The one that was preceding this was one customs. Um, you don't have to worry about these things. Uh, normally the invoice, um, the documentation you receive that mentions which system was used. If you are still unsure, you can always ask your client or the relevant custom agent. But it's straightforward. Once you start dealing with these invoices, uh, you do a few of them, you'll get used to this stuff. Then collect rate, which was your collect rate. If you click on it, you have a drop down menu, Karachi, Sialco dry port, whichever. Uh, for this example, I've selected the Sialco dry port. GD good declaration type will be selected. Their number and date would be entered. You will enter the export value. Uh, you, the value of the goods and services that you actually ship, the value of any short set shipment if applicable, and any goods or services which are admissible for refund. And then you'll enter the system made with, again, your custom process. Uh, the receipt date for, uh, from that system would be entered here. While you are entering these details, the main receipt uh, date, whether this was one custom, we bought, any ideas? It's common sense really. 
even if you have never dealt with it before. Cross check, cross efforts. You are claiming you did this thing. Did you actually do it? If you actually did it, the record would be there. Do you remember in an actual B, which we covered just a short while before, you have to enter the GD details, group declaration detail. Again, that is linked with the custom system. Same idea is working at here. Uh, again, once you have done this, you can click on add, and this would be added. If you would rather do it in a smaller form, I mean, not spending that much time entering all individual detail, individually for every transaction, you should have an Excel file prepared before in which you have entered all the relevant detail, adjusting for the relevant um, format and all. You would attach file here, again, browse, select the file, attach, that would be added here. Then you can click on go to the return and you'll come back to return. Since you have filled an extra A to D, all the relevant figures will be calculated automatically and entered here. Only the white areas would be left for you now to enter. For example, if you have a look at serial number 23A, default surcharge, if any, you would enter. 24 uh, is areas, if any, enter. 25, default penalty, if any, penalty or fine, please enter that. Uh, come on to the next slide, 23A, default surcharge, others, if they are, please enter. Uh, 24B and 5B, I'm sorry, I was repeating that. 27, tax paid on normal or previous return applicable in case of an amended return. So unless you are revising the return, this is not applicable to you. If you are revising, then you enter the relevant amount here and done. You fill the four and extra, you fill these fields if applicable to you. It might be you have no, which is normally the case, you have no fine or penalty, then you leave them out blank. You are filing the return for the first time, you leave this field out blank. Done. What do I do next? You click on this button, save. Always do that. If you don't do that, all the data you have been entering with such hard work will be lost. In fact, the way I recommend after doing every next year, save it. So that if you have a turbulence for some reason, your system shuts off, maybe there is a total power breakdown or maybe your UPS went up or maybe something happened while you're with your system, whatever, all your hard work would still be saved. It would not be wasted. You would not have to re-enter each and every transaction. So just click on the save. So your transaction, your data entered would be saved. Then click on verify. Once you will click on verify, you will have something like this coming up. Here, basically you have to confirm that you are the person who has entered this data. So for example, I was uh, filling this up. So this is my data. I'm confirming my name, Ayum Zaheer, my CNIC number. Confirm verification and done. So once this is done, then you click on the submit button which is here and your return is submitted. This button would become active once you have completed the verification process. So after you submit the return, it would ask you to confirm, enter your PIN, you will enter PIN, confirm, your return will be submitted. And after submitted, uh, submitting the return, you would have something like this, print acknowledgement, print it and save it in the relevant folder on your system then print return, they are two different things. Acknowledgement is confirming you submitted the return on XYZ date. Print option actually prints the return, entire return that you submitted. So the best thing is to always keep both of them safe with you. That would help you fulfill your legal responsibilities. Done and dusted. This brings us to filing a revised sales tax return. Don't you just love it? Enjoying? Nice and easy? Mushkil to Not too complicated? Great. But uh, before we proceed, let's take any questions that you may have. So we have some uh, questions, but if you have any bit of which you haven't yet written. Okay, interesting. Okay, I have a few questions. I'll start answering them. Meanwhile, you can just type the questions that you have in mind. 
Sir, is the penalty imposed on company of not withholding sales tax of company who is not sales tax exempt is similar to income tax? Um, Bilal, uh, I assume you are asking whether the penalties for not withholding the applicable sales tax are similar to income tax. In nature, yes, the exact one, sales tax on Services Act 2012. Where do you get that? The Act on the website of PRA. Uh, you want to see the session available on KCC Pakistan's channel on Vimeo and my channel on YouTube, Uma Zahibi. Uh, the sessions from last year are completely available on KCC's Vimeo channel. They are not fully updated on KCC's YouTube channel yet because that was launched later on. Sayyid Nazim Abbas, on the whole, this been a good exposure. Thank you. But can you please elaborate the PRA and sales tax laws for categorizing the minimum threshold for registration? What about the retailer and basic service provider? Now, then, uh, I answered this before. Uh, might be you have joined in late. I'll quickly rephrase it. Basically, PRA has been evolving. And they have reached a stage now where they are saying if you are providing any taxable service, Please do get registered. Simple. Why? If you are providing sales tax service, it's not income tax. That would be levied only if you have an income of more than 400,000. If you are providing taxable services in Punjab, you are already dealing in the business of sales tax. You might as well properly account for and discharge your legal responsibility. Sishan Rashid, sound of webinar is muted to our side. Uh, no, Zishan, not anymore. Obad is saying no audio. Are you guys able to hear? Uh, can someone confirm if they are able to hear me? Yes, 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 yes. So um, guys who said uh, they are experiencing, a couple of people who said they are experiencing issues, it seems to be something at your end. The portal is not showing any issues as yet here. And uh, a lot of members are saying it's perfectly audible. So going back to the questions, meanwhile, you can write more questions if you have any. Uh, last question I answered was uh, Sayyid Nazim Abbas. So it's Muhammad Saqib Raza. So please tell me the rate of 5% and 16% applicable on the consumer. No idea whether I have to charge 5%, 16%. Saqib, for most of the services, it's 16%. For telecoms, it's 19 and a half. Some areas are changed in case of import and export. And the rate of withholding uh, actually differs. So for that, you would have to uh, see my session on Punjab Sales Tax on Services Act 2012. And that is available on um, ACC Pakistan's Vimeo channel and on YouTube. Uh, if you would rather have it, it's also available on my personal channel. Same ACC session, uh, which I delivered on my personal channel on YouTube. Uh, that's by my name, Umar Zahiri. Go through that. You will have answers to them all. Adnan Khan, I have a question that I encounter a lot while activation of e-enrollment. Activation code is not sent to the mobile mostly. You're right, Adnan, that is a practical issue that quite that happens quite often actually. And without entering it, the process could not be completed. What to do in such a situation? Aha, uh -huh, good question. So see, I'm gonna solve one of your major headaches right now, like this. You send an email to eSupport, the support email that I shared with you earlier and that you have in uh, your copy of the presentation, which is in the hands out section of the control panel. What you do in that email, you mention uh, your text number, you copy paste the message that you received uh, to enter the relevant codes. You mentioned the email code that you have received and the fact that you did not receive the code on the mobile. And then you follow them up by call and they normally activate it for you. That's how it works in practice. 
Sermon, an extra A and C are used for what purpose? And if a business have nil activity in any specific month, then what would be the treatment for an extra A and C? Sermon, an extra A is used for domestic purchases, an extra C is used for domestic sales. If there is a nil return, an extra would be nil. But how to file the nil return? We are just going to see that in a bit. Don't you worry. Muhammad Saki Bruza. Sir, whether I can charge sales tax to the consumer and say, yes, you can. Actually, um, Sakib, it's an interesting question. Uh, over the break, I was discussing just uh, this with uh, Harun here, that one of the prime issues post-18 amendment has been harmonization. I mean, uh, while the focus has been on the point of origination, uh, Certain offices at time issue you demand depending on where the client was based. So uh, that is an issue like uh, PRA would say, okay, the one supplying the service was based here. So they are to be charged sales tax on services based in Punjab because they are earning from here. SRB would say, no, actually the customer was based here. So while informally the rules have been agreed to see where the service has been delivered, uh, practically, such situation does arise where there is a conflict and then, in effect, a double taxation. So what do you do in that case? Unfortunately, if a demand is issued, you, by demand mean, for example, PRA has issued, uh, told the supplier that you have to pay this much sales tax on services, assuming he didn't account for it, and SRB has issued to the customer, telling them that they have to pay it, so you have to agree which party wants to take the incidence and then you have to contest one party. Normally uh, what they do is they focus on where the service was actually delivered and it's their right, not where the service originated from. Though at times it can be argued, it's one of those areas that has made things complicated for a uh, businessman here and something that bodies uh, do need to work out on and they are working on, so hopefully they should read some agreements pretty soon. Okay, next up. Uh, Zile Rahman, please share the process of creation of sales tax PSID Chala. Okay, uh, Zile Rahman, good question. The PSID, the Chalan, was not within the purview of today, but I thought it's extremely relevant. So what we have done is, if you have a look in the handout section, I have two gifts for you there. Actually, there are five gifts, but of them there are two. One says, payment of Texas PRA. This is basically a short listing of the entire process how you can create the PSD. Go through that and you should be able to do that. Then you have the PRA tax payment form which you can use. So this should help you with the PSID. In case you still feel some confusion, if you have time left, ask me at the end of the session, I'll show you or shoot me an email. Tariq Khan, sir, after registration in PRA, will they allow to us as STRN number or for STRN we need another process? Yes, after registration and enrollment, you will be alert, alerted. Uh, this number, which is normally your PNTN. Sirmat, thanks, sir. You're welcome, Sirmat. Mohammed Sakib Rila. If the consumers are registered in Sin Revenue Board and they withhold our sales tax as a withholding agent, can we claim that in PRA that they have withheld our sales tax? Yes, you can. Umair Ehsan, is it compulsory to file sales tax after every month or can we file it after two or three months? Umair, once you get registered, it is your responsibility to file sales tax return in a timely fashion every month. Even if you have no business activity, it doesn't matter. File a nil return, but it is your responsibility to file a return. If you do not file a return, you can end up with having a penalty notice. Although as I shared before, currently uh, SPRA is in, uh, believe they are in an evolutionary phase and educating the taxpayer, they don't 
penalize you, they just issue you reminder notices, but by law you can be, so you have to file that every month. Asilah Rahman, thank you sir, you are most welcome. Mohammed Saqib Raza, sir, deadline of filing sales tax return and the fine imposed if we file sales tax return after due date. Saqib, again, they are given within the act. As to the deadline, I did share with you, perhaps you join late, so I'll quickly show you. Just keep an eye on your screen. This is in the presentation that you have in the handout section, uh, titled Umar ACC STR PRA filing. That is the registration. Uh, that is the presentation on this. Here you can see the date of filing required, which is pretty much standard for everyone 18, except for telecoms for which it's 21st. However, there is a slight point to consider. While the last date for filing is 18, the system does become a bit slow on 18, so it's advisable to file. It's slightly before. However, the last date of payment is 15. You have to make the payment by 15. So some people uh, who are new to this do get confused by it. They assume if the last date of filing is 18, we can pay the tax liability by 18. It doesn't work this way. For payment of your sales tax liability, if you have a net payable, the date is 15. So this is a handy thing. You can always keep it with you. Shows you the deadlines, details, all that. Okay, let's go back to your questions. Um, thanks a lot. You are welcome. Great. We are pretty much done with the questions. Great initiative by ACCS Omar. Thank you, Sakib Sahab. Okay, any other questions? If you have any other questions, I'm giving you a few seconds. If not, then we'll continue. Okay, we have Tariq Khan. Sir, do we need to register in another province on the basis of services delivered in that province? If yes, then do we need to file only those invoices which we delivered in that province? Very good question, Tariq. That's what I was just discussing a while ago, the harmonization issues. What businesses do in practice is, uh, especially the businesses who have a national presence, uh, not just within a city or a province, they do register with all the relevant authority. So, uh, for example, we have uh, quite a few clients who are registered with FPR, SRB, PRA, KPRA, and we even have a few who are registered with the Balochistan Taxation Authorities as well. Anyway, the question that is uh, next and the answer to your first part is yes. The question that you ask next is very interesting. What do you do then? Well, as per their laws, you focus on the incidents where the service that you are delivering is based and whether that has been originated locally. For example, your branch office is based in Islamabad and it's providing a service to your client in Islamabad. It's pretty straightforward. You will file a sales tax on services within the purview of Islamabad, which is administered by FPR at the moment. Uh, you have a client based in Lahore. You are providing service out of Lahore. Straightforward. File it with FPR. Uh, you have a client in Karachi. You are filing. Uh, you are providing the service out of your office based in Karachi. File it there. You have a client in Peshawar. Providing it uh, from your office in Peshawar. File it there. Client in Koita, service from Koita, file it there. Problem happens when you have office in one area and you have the client in the next. Uh, practically, uh, what businesses do is they look at where the client is based and file it with that authority. However, at times, two compli uh, complications do arise, and normally other revenue bodies claim that you are based here. So then you have to prove uh, either that the service did not originate from their jurisdiction, or that since you were previously already taxed by the other authority, it would be double taxation. Hence, it would be an adjustment anyway. Mati Vemad, in purchases, all purchases included in a service sector. Uh, uh, can you clarify that, Munti? What do you mean in purchases, all purchases included in the service sector? I'm assuming you're asking whether uh, 
in the sales tax return for services all the purchases are only for services if you are asking that not necessarily it can be for goods as well if they were uh, bought to provide a certain taxable supply if you are asking something else just please clarify and i'll be happy to answer okay um, i think rest our comments well thanks for your appreciation i appreciate your kind feedback helps us be motivated and i guess that's it for the questions if you have any more questions please write them we will come back to them again okay next up what we covered till now is what is taxation direct versus indirect taxes what are sales taxes um, the history of sales tax in pakistan the current legal constitutional position punjab revenue authority its ambit how does it work its basic structure uh, how the policy policies are set up uh, then we have seen how do we register for uh, register for an nt uh, for uh, sales tax on services with pra if we have an ntn what we do if we do not have an ntn what we do if we have an ntn but pra system do not recognize us we have also seen how do we de enroll for the first time and how do we activate our pe enrollment we have also gone through the contact details the tax period submission deadlines etc we have also quickly had uh, we also quickly had a look at the first schedule which outlines the details of the service areas the hs codes etc um, we also uh, after that uh, quickly discussed about the 10th amendment uh, we have gone through the example of filing the sales tax return in that we have seen the main return where you enter the data where you don't we have seen an exchange a which is for domestic purchase an exchange b for imports an exchange c for domestic sales an exchange d for exports rest of the return verifying submission and keeping the copies yeah pretty much it. so far so good next up what if you have to file a revised return what do you do first question why would you need to file a revised return maybe you made an error you didn't realize that time your junior maybe your trainee was working on the return you are supposed to review the work something happened maybe the client didn't provide the invoice any reason and there is an error now and you want to rectify that error what do you do let's find out okay again this is the last page of the return uh, if you'll go into declaration and you'll go on sales tax and then sales tax on services for your relevant period before september or after september i'll quickly show you for those who joined late here when you'll click on declaration you'll have this drop down menu of sales tax click on that you have these options either sales tax uh, on services return which is for period before september 2017 or for uh, this option for period of september 2017 and onwards so if it's a recent one you'll click on this one and once you'll click on this it would give you something like this you'll click on uh, sales tax on services after selecting the period let's say we want to revise the return for september you'll select uh, you'll select september 2017 here click on sales tax on services and it will show you something like this which mean your return has already been filed in this case a null return was filed for this client for this particular period so how do you revise that i filed the null return the client said oh i'm sorry i forgot i did actually have some transaction it was not a nil return after all okay thank you very much but we need to revise that now extremely simple no complication click on this option proposed revision prepare proposed revised return you click on this and you will have the entire return open up to you like that you will have the old figures of the return appearing to you 
and what you need to do is amend them. For example, let's assume that uh, everything else was nil, but he did make a couple of purchases, domestic purchases. So I don't need to amend anything else. I just need to amend an extra array. I'll click on an extra array. It will bring me here. I'll enter the relevant details. I'll enter the NDN number. I'll enter the document number, invoice number, the date, HS code, etc., etc., the relevant amount. I'll add this and I'll go back to the return. Done. What I'll do after this is same I did for submitting my original return. I'll click on save. I'll click on verify. I'll enter my CNIC, my details to verify. I'll confirm the verification and I'll submit it. And then I'll allow it the submission by entering my PIN, which is basically serving as my digital signature. PIN is a short digit combination that you receive and you can also reset from within this area from these options of your account and you have to enter that as the last step to authorize the submission of return. I'll do that, I'll submit, done, gone. My return has been revised just like that. Okay, what if I need to revise for let's say I also made some domestic sales then I'll go and amend an extra C. Same process really. Uh, you go on an extra C, you enter the relevant details in an extra C, simple. The invoice details, uh, value of the sale, the relevant taxation deduction, any withheld, all that, and done. You come back, you again verify, first you save. Always save. Once you have entered the data for any invoice, be it on the sales side or purchase side, it doesn't matter, save it, save it, save it, golden rule of thumb. You would realize that as you start working on bigger returns, at times for bigger clients you have dozens of it. invoices, even to the tunes of hundreds. You do not believe me. You do not want to end up losing them. So save them. Once they are saved, click on verify. You'll verify the details, same. This thing will come up, you'll verify, confirm verification. Click on submit, done. So it could be that you have to revise a return because you have domestic purchase. Then you simply amend an extra A. It might be you have some imports, amend an extra B2. It might be you have domestic sales, amend an extra C. It might be you have exports, amend an extra D, and so on. So not too difficult, is it? Great. Let's move on to filing a revised sales tax return. Sorry, let's move on from filing a revised sales tax return on to filing a nil and null return. Ready, Samak? You asked about it. Meanwhile, if you have any question, you can ask now. We do have some questions coming in. Wow. Okay. Interesting. The last question we answered was by Tariq Khan Sahab. Now we have uh, by Mati Rahman, curated in the service sector. Okay, Zilla Rahman asked, Sir, my friend has submitted nil return for from two years but he also paid sales tax payable by the end of every month. My question is, can we revise all those returns now? 24 months returns, yes. Thank you. Wow, what was your friend doing? If he was paying sales tax, why was he not accruing for them? Anyway, to answer your question, you would have to write to the commissioner and give them a justification. Why were you doing that? Because it's going back to like almost two years, it's their prerogative and they can allow you to revise return. And then you can revise them. Uh, some of them, for most recent period, you can just go and revise using the process that I told you. Uh, wherever the limitation would come, you would have to write to the 
Next one, Sayyid Nazim Abbas. Will I withhold the sales tax on the taxable services provided by the parties registered in other provinces? What about the service providers registered in Islamabad? Yes, you would need to withhold as per the rules and as per the schedules in Sales Tax Act uh, on uh, actually Sales Tax on Services in Punjab Act 2012. And finally, is there a time limit to revise a return? Uh, Irfan, there is a time limit described uh, in the rules, but practically, uh, in our experience, uh, well, I wouldn't be like bragging, but uh, we normally are very particular not to be late and get the thing done right. Uh, in our experiences with PRA, we only had to revise it in up to two, three months at the most. Um, as per the rules and legislation, although this is a bit outside the ambit, but I'm answering you, you would uh, probably need to write to the commissioner. You would need their permission. Just like the example Zilli Rahman discussed, going back two years, three years, if for some reason you need to, you would then possibly need their permission. Adnan Khan, what is the deadline for revision once original filing done, like it's 60 days in case of income tax filing revision? Within a month of filing it, you can do it normally. There's no issue beyond that. Um, if it's like older, maybe a year old or something, you normally need to solve the permission. Tariq Khan, sir, is the revised return after due? Is this revised return? for after due dates or in due dates. What if we already created a PSID and Chalan? Very good. Tariq, a very good question. I did show you this area in the return where you have to enter the figure for any tax that you have paid, adjustments, the tax you already paid. That is in the case of a revised return, where you already filed a return. So the answer is, it can be a return you have submitted mail and want to revise. It can be a return for which you have already paid the tax and want to revise. If it's for, it, uh, for a uh, for particular return for which, assuming you have already paid the tax, one of the two scenarios will happen. Either you would have a refund claimable, mean you paid more, so that would be adjustable. In next month's liability, you can adjust it. The second scenario, additional liability would be created. So you would need to create another chalan for the difference, and that would also appear in the system and submit the revised return. You would not be able to submit the revised return with additional liability without paying the additional amount using the revised or new chalan. I hope that answers your question. Tariq, um, Zeshan Rashid, how to attach CPR in a revised sales tax return as feed CPR tab remains invisible? When you are revising the return after you have uh, done everything and there is an additional tax liability, it should become active and the CPR that you have paid should appear within the return area. And once you can uh, tie it up with the additional new CPR for the additional tax liability that was created and which you pay, you would be able to submit the revised return. Oh, yes, we are ready. Thanks, sir. You're welcome, sir. Uh, Mary Joss, don't we need commissioner permission for revision? Uh, not if you are doing it immediately for like a nil return. If after that, yes, you will do. Abdul Rakib, is this compulsory to register on PRA if he does not receive any services or deliver services? No, Abdul, it is not compulsory uh, to register with PRA if you do not receive or provide any services at all. With PRA, you have to register if you are providing taxable services within Punjab. That's it. If you are not providing taxable services and you are receiving taxable services only, even then you do not need, need to register. Uh, Adnan Khan, what's the maximum time till which revision can be done 
this was my question actually. Adnan, theoretically, no time bar as long as the commissioner allows you. Practically, nobody would allow you unless you have a real good reason beyond a few months or a year at the most. Practically, by virtue of the other laws with three years time bar, beyond that would be next to, um, I wouldn't say impossible, nothing is impossible really, but uh, would be very, very difficult because think about it, there are legal precedent. What can you justify? Why didn't you properly file a return uh, from three years ago or two years ago? And how have you realized after two years that it was wrong? <coughs> So first you have to give a justification. Then normally they also see, uh, okay, this is slightly off the record. Uh, one of the factors which they never say, but uh, does make a difference, is whether an additional liability is being created or additional benefit is being claimed. Read between the lines, you'll get the idea. Anand Khan uh, has done. Abdul Rakib, currently there is an issue in my company that auditors has given us invoice and amount of sales tax on services was X amount and our tax persons has have uh, tax person has paid for amount and taken in October 2017 but the auditors have taken invoice in the month of November what can we do now? Okay, Rakeem, I'm not really getting you here. What do you mean by uh, our tax person paid the amount and took it in October, but the auditor took it in November? Do you mean that the auditors are accounting it for in the month of November? Or do you mean something else by that? Please clarify. Khalif Daud, okay. Okay, Khalid has a suggestion which I'll pass on. He's saying that the training time should be around the prayer time, maybe 9 to 1 or obviously after 2. Okay, uh, we'll make note of the suggestion. Any other question? That's it. All the questions are answered. I'll give you 30 seconds. If you guys have any more question, please feel free to ask. If not, we'll resume. Okay guys, uh, we have another question. Zillar Eman asked for my email. I'll be sharing that at the end of the presentation. But meanwhile, Zillar Eman, you have that in the copy of the presentation, which you have in the handout section. And if you go to the second last slide, you have my contact details, including my email. And we have another question. This one is from Abdul Rakib. We have received sales tax invoice in November, but paid tax on 15 November to file return of October. Okay. And so, okay, I'll add this up with your last question. So basically, Abdul Rakib's question is, they received a sales tax invoice in November accruing to the month of October. Okay, your auditors are actually not doing right here because there is a concept called accruals. It's not cash-based accounting. I'm assuming uh, you are following the accounting standards and are a corporate entity or even if you are a sole proprietor. Cash-based accounting is not in work unless you are in public sector organization which has adopted it. So uh, on the accruals basis, the invoice does belong to the month of October. Uh, someone, someone senior need to sit down with your auditor
and just very politely remind them about the concept of approvals. It has to be accounted for in the month of October. I hope uh, that answers you, Abdul Raki. Anybody else? Okay, so if you have any questions now, please enter them and I will answer them in the next question answer session. Next up, let's resume. We have seen how do we file a sales tax return in an entirety. We have also seen how do we file a sales tax return uh, in case of a revision, whether we have to revise just one annexure or more than one. What if we have to file a nil or null sales tax return? What do we mean by a nil sales tax return? There was no taxable activity. There was no business activity in this particular accounting period, normally a month in this case. What do we do? Let's find out. Okay, again, you go to the same return. You come to the end of the return. You do not go in any of the annexure. You do not need to fill any annexure. They are not applicable to you. Why they are not applicable to you? because you did not have any domestic sales, you did not have any imports, you did not have any domestic uh, purchase or sale, uh, you did not have any uh, exports, you have no taxable activity. So you come straight down here and there is this tab nil return. You click on this and it asks you in this pop-up box, are you sure you want to file nil return? Null return, they actually call it null. You say yes, okay. You click that, then you click on verify. The same tab like before will open. You confirm your details, you confirm verification, and this tab of submit would become active. You would click on this, it would ask you, do you actually want to submit? You would enter your PIN, the four digit, normally four digit combination you have, you would click OK, it would process, done, your return is submitted. You would click on print acknowledgement and you will print a copy of the acknowledgement and you would print the return. This return, by the way, here was a nil return. So you would. this is what you'll get after filing the nil return. You'll click on print acknowledgement and print. Acknowledgement, like before, would only give you acknowledgement that yes, you did file return and print it would give you a copy of your nil return. Previously it was the complete return, now it's the nil return. That's it, straightforward, no issue. Next up, what are the current sales tax rates and what are the implications? So broadly speaking guys, the standard rate generally is 16% in the case of PRA. For telecom services generally it's 19.5%. But like I showed you before uh, on PRA's website, you do get these circulars, clarifications, and notifications from time to time. Look, like for example, uh, we had the last circular on 20th of October this year, just last month. Punjab sales tax on the services of intercity carriage of goods by rail or road. So what do we do on inter-service carriage now? Here, that's been answered here now. Government is pleased to extend the operation of circular number two until 31st December or until further orders. So that's been extended in terms of the scope. But circulars are not the only things. At times they are confusion. Uh, with terms to the harmonization issues, uh, amendment with regard to the rates. So they would be issued here. And then if there are any particular notifications, they would be in this section. For example, exemption was granted to Punjab South Pani Company, which uh, I'm sure you would know is a government backed initiative. Um, extension in the date of filing of return for September 2017, etc., etc. So keep a lookout on this. Uh, normally, the changes in rates are mentioned here in the circulars. So, where do I find the details of the rates? How do I know 
exactly which sector is being covered under which rate, the second schedule. Uh, I have given you a handout of the second schedule too. Again, it's in the handout section. The last PDF file titled second schedule. And let's quickly have a look at the second schedule too. <coughs> Here you go. So basically the first schedule list all the possible major services under the major service uh, heads. The second schedule actually lists the rates applicable <coughs> and any particular exemptions. So you can see for hot, uh, hotels, motels, guest houses, marriage halls and lawns, including bandles, shamina, ser shamiana services, clubs and caterers at 16%. All these codes are covered for classification. So you can, uh, you can go through them all. See, telecom services are normally 19.5%. So uh, exclusions are mentioned here. Uh, this doesn't cover the internet services where dial-up or, or broadband including email services. DCNS and value-added data services are involved. Um, Insurance policy include, excludes marine insurance for export. It's 16% of gross premium paid. So um, you can go through this. Actually, uh, this is not really within the embed, but I just added this for the sake of completeness. This is covered in extensive detail in the session on Punjab Sales Tax on Services Act. Today was just focus on registering, filing, revising, and ancillary issues. Okay, uh, another difference is for freight forwarding agents, that's a fixed amount, rupees 400 per bill of landing. Other than that, mostly it's 16%. So you can consult these rates and the circulars and notifications, and you know the applicable rates. Great. Some of the ancillary issues. Before we go on to that, if you have any questions, you can ask now. I promise you, none of your questions would be left unanswered, at least not the relevant ones, inshallah. We are right on track. Okay, we have Adnan Khan. If anyone registered like we did here for understanding only, should we still file a return? Adnan, we did not register for that reason. We didn't complete the registration process because if you do get registered now, then you are responsible to file return. What to do if you get registered by mistake or if you did get registered but you never started the business, then you have to apply for deregistration. There's a process to follow. Uh, you ensure that the last period sales tax return is submitted, no outstanding liability is outstanding against you, and then you apply in writing to your relevant commissioner that this is the reason I want to deregister, kindly allow me that. You perform their verification, you have to follow them up, stay in touch, and finally you are allowed deregistration. But don't do that. Uh, it's quite a hectic process. Don't do that in uh, case you just want to test. Don't. Otherwise, keep on filing nil returns. Best of luck with that. Uh, nil return every year. As at now, we have no intention of provision of taxable services. Then nil return will be filed every year. Uh, no, Adnan, nil return would be filed every month. Income tax return is filed once a year. Your withholding statements are normally filed monthly in terms of income tax, which is again non-relevant. In terms of sales tax on services, you have to file your return normally every month. You do not file just one return annually. Okay, that should answer this. Any other questions? Zale Rahman. So sales tax registration is also necessary for cottage industry providing taxable services in Punjab, unfortunately. Yes. Next. Cottage industry do get uh, benefits in terms of income tax. Remember one thing. 
income tax is basically the burden on the business sales tax is effectively what they are passing on they are buying something they pay the sales tax on that they sell something they pass on the sales tax on that they collect sales tax on that and if there is net amount which they need to pay the government they pay them so who is giving that net amount the difference their customers it's been collected from them so sales tax is not basically that the business is paying any tax oh no 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 they are basically just collecting the taxes and passing it on to the government they are just acting as a, a withholding agent income tax is the tax that has the direct incidence on them which is basically the tax with that is accruing on business their incomes and that is being passed on although we do have a different concept in income tax to the turnover tax which is in nature an indirect tax because it's transactional uh, however that is an incidence on the business business cannot take that from the customer and pass it on business has to bear the burden of that taxation sales tax and consumer is bearing the burden next one G or which any other questions no okay yeah we have the questions coming please share the soft copy of the presentation at the end of this session uh, good idea only we have already done that uh, I have told that repeatedly if you have a look at the control panel uh, the second last tab is handouts, five out of five. The second file in handouts, Umar, ACC, STR, PRA filing, that is the copy of today's presentation. So you have that and you can download that. If we receive taxable services from, okay, next one is Abdul Rakhi. If we receive taxable services from KPK, then to which government we pay the tax, either to Punjab or KPK? Well, the KPK guy would withhold some portion of the tax which they'll pass on to KPK in your return. You'll mention this much tax was withheld for which you'll uh, claim the benefit and you'll pay your tax to the PR. Unless a problem happens and KPK issues your supplier some uh, notice uh, and they get in touch with you, then you provide them the relevant documentation and they will the unfortunate party would have to contest it out with the KPK. And finally, we have invoiced services and later on receivable amount was not recoverable. Bankruptcy. Will there be any rebate? So uh, what you can do is next time when you deal with a party, be with it select uh, carefully. PRA is still in the evolving stage. <clears throat> in theory, there is a rebate available, not really practically, but they are working on it to introduce systems for that. I hope uh, that was not a very big invoice if one. Next one, uh, thanks a lot, sir. You are welcome. Any other questions? If you don't have any questions, then I'll... Okay, you do. Tariq Khan, sir, why poor and rich pay the same sales tax? Isn't this unequal to poor? <laughs> okay, uh, that's a question on a policy matter. Uh, well, Tariq, uh, there are two sides of the coin. Uh, the government says that people don't like to pay taxes, economy is not documented, so we have to focus on indirect taxes. Uh, indirect tax has this issue that uh, effectively the people with lower income are being taxed at a higher proportion. To understand this, if you are buying a bottle of water and your driver is buying a bottle of water, you are certainly earning much more than your driver, but you both are paying the same amount of sales tax on that water bottle. So what is effectively happening is you are paying a very smaller amount of your income but your driver is paying who is earning less than you is paying a higher amount of tax on that water bottle. Uh, so yes that is a problem that's why uh, 
we uh, even at ACCA, um, uh, I'm honored to be chairing the taxation committee of ACCA and ACCA in our budget proposal and even in its global taxation uh, principle focus a lot on just equitable taxation policies which are transparent and we have sent numerous proposals, we send them almost every year uh, to government to focus more on direct taxes. Um, so I think it's a work in process and hopefully if we continue to work on it, things will start improving further. Okay, thanks a lot, you're welcome. Tax consultants also charge 16% but the event. Uh, tax consultant charge 16%. I'm assuming you are asking about their professional fees. Uh, well, it depends from tax consultant to tax consultant. Depend on the quality, the name, the service you are getting. Just like you board an airplane, going to the same destination, business class is play, uh, always, almost, in fact, always paying more than the economic class. Why? Same plane, same destination going at the same time, landing at the same time, everything same, not really. The level of service enjoyed is not the same. Uh, however, if you meant by it, Mateev, that whether the tax consultant charge a tax 16%, not really. The tax is submit, uh, submitted at uh, the time of return submission, or if you are paying the tax before that in the government kitty, in the treasury. And to see the details of that, you can go in handouts, payment of taxes and payment of tax form. Okay, Mativ is asking the sales tax on services consulting fee. Uh, again, Mativ, that would depend on the nature, whether you are just filing return, you have a complicated issue, you want to contest a case regarding harmonization, double taxation, and who you are going to. Certainly the value involved with matter and um, the one you are dealing with matter and your personal equation with that really matter. Anything else? No? Okay, if you have any other questions, continue to write them. We will just finish off these last few bits and then we'll have a question answer session again to answer any questions that you have and then we'll end the session today. So some of the ancillary practical issues. We have discussed about the theory and we have discussed about the concepts, we have discussed about the practical situation. Some of the things that are different, for example, we saw that the link on PRS website for registration in case you don't have an NTM doesn't work anymore. Although it's still there, it's in their material, but it doesn't work. See, some of the other things that we should look out for is if you want to check status of your registration application here, let me show you the process. You just enter your NTN, the application reference number, image character, okay. It tells you what's going on with your application at the moment. One, if you want to check the status of your registration application, use this link. Make sense? Nice and easy. Next one, if you want to search the taxpayer, there are two things. You want to see who is registered, you can search the entire database. Or you want to see who is active taxpayer with PRA. Word of caution. This is different than the active taxpayer list ATL of FPR on the basis of which you get taxation benefit uh, from uh, in terms of lower rates on banking transactions lower rates of tax deduction on banking transaction, on uh, motor vehicle registration, on plot purchase sale. These are all income tax related. The active taxpayer list for that is the one with FPR, Federal Board of Revenue. What's the point of this active taxpayer search then, Omar sir? The point is this, if you are dealing with a new party for the first time, you need to make sure, and even for ongoing parties, whether they are active or not, because if they are not active, you are supposed to withhold 100% tax because if they don't end up paying their tax liability, you will have to and possibly with some penalties. So that's why it's important. You click here, you enter the NTN of the relevant parties, you enter the image characters, you click here and you get the information whether the taxpayer is active or not. Let's uh, try this one. 
let me show you how this work active taxpayer list of PRA so this taxpayer is active you can see this okay green tick compliance level 100% the taxpayer is active for past six months the taxpayer has filed all their returns and their compliance level is 100% just a quick uh, handy tool which you should be aware of checking the status of your registration application for new registration applications and searching the taxpayers active taxpayers if you just want to search any taxpayer you can enter their NTN here and you can have the details and you can see whether they are a taxpayer but it doesn't show you the compliance level whether they are active or not for that you have to go here in the active taxpayer search great Next up, browser issues. PRS website is open in almost all the browsers, but in our experience, the best result you get is uh, in Google Chrome or in Internet Explorer. One of the latest versions are usually better. You don't uh, hit into any snags or any issues. Dead links, some links are dead, like I've shown you for that NTN registration. Don't worry, you can always approach their helpline for those who have just uh, joined the session or joined in late. Uh, we have shared the contact details of PRA. Here they are on your slide number 19. You can call them up, but I found the most efficient way to get a response out of them is by email. But yeah, do follow them up by phone. It makes things much quicker. Okay, um, evolving nature. All this that we have covered covers the topic for today in extensive details. But you do have to remember one thing. PRA is continuously evolving, both in terms of the legislation, in terms of the infrastructure, in terms of the website. Even the return process was modified just a couple of months back for September 2017 onward. So keep that in mind. It might be that few years down the line, there might be some changes. There might be some uh, amendments, alterations. So don't get worried if you watch this after a few months uh, that what happened. There might have been the changes introduced by PRA. With this, we have pretty much covered all the relevant areas. Uh, I promised to share my contact details with you. They are there in front of you. You have my cell number, you have my office number, my email, my website. I'm not on Facebook. I'm on an alternate myMFP.com. You have my ID there, my Twitter handle, my office address. More than welcome to contact anytime. Always happy to assist uh, our fraternity. Uh, best way to reach me is send me an email. Even quicker than that, send me a message. Uh, you can send me a message on WhatsApp, you can uh, send me an SMS. Whatever you do for the first time, please mention a brief intro, your name, where you are, and we met in this session. So uh, you have a copy of this presentation with you too. Um, so I'll leave the slide open with you. If you have any questions now, please feel free to ask them. And we do have some time. So we should be able to answer the relevant questions first and then any ancillary questions that you may have. Okay, we do have some uh, questions. Keep them coming, keep them coming. Okay, uh, first one is Moiz Ahmad. How to find out if the taxpayer has withholding exemption certificate on income tax? Well, FPR has launched, just yesterday FPR has launched a verification service for exemption certificate. You can go on FPR website, enter their details and verify whether their exemption certificate is genuine. Initially, the taxpayer themselves will tell you we hold an exemption certificate. This is our exemption, certi uh, exemption certificate and you can go on FPR's website and verify 
then that exemption certificate is genuine. Next one, Noman Islam. Meanwhile, rest of you, any questions? Whatever we covered today, if you have any questions about that, please keep them coming. No question is a stupid question. Don't feel embarrassed. Let them come. Uh, Noman Islam, I want to join sales tax experience due to get option at UAE for indirect tax job. Okay. I believe Noman is saying he wants to know about sales tax so he can exploit the opportunity by the introduction of VAT in Middle East, particularly UAE. I have EY experience of three months, but my further experience is in accounts and analysis. Having 2.2 years experience, but I'm free as my company, I won't name your company, closed its Islamabad office five months ago. Now I want to join indirect text field again, make something for me. Okay, that's one of the most interesting questions I've ever received from Mark. How can I make something for you? Uh, the way to go about it is uh, that you should look out for opportunities that provide you your desired experience. Since you don't have much experience in it, you should be mentally prepared to even accept a junior position. Spend some time there, a few months. Uh, it's been slightly delayed. Uh, the process should really have been at uh, the point of five months ago. But it's never too late to start. Get the experience for at least a few months, and then you should be able to enter the UA market. Next up. By the way, we do have some uh, sessions planned on UAT VAT. Um, it might be a few weeks, but uh, the session would be really worth it. So keep watching out this space. Um, Sir, Sir, thanks a lot. It was a very informative session, and as usual, I always enjoy learn a lot from you. Uh, your ACCA sessions, Chizakala. Thank you very much, Sarmad, for your kind words. It's always a pleasure to contribute. And uh, well, kind-hearted members like you help keep us motivated too. Wes Yunus, how can we check that organization should register for PRA, especially in NPO cases? Wes, rule of thumb, providing taxation services in Punjab, yes, get registered. Nice and easy. If you are NPO, apply for the NPO status. Just being an NPO is not sufficient. You have to apply for NPO status with FPR separately in order to get that status from tax perspective as well. Sumaya Fatima. Sir, is this important to learn the income tax laws and the PRA rules? How can we learn these? Yes, Sumaya, it is important. Uh, well, unless you are some kind of uh, exceptional person with extraordinary memory and can just learn them all and recall them at a whim, um, I would suggest the best way to do about it, uh, do about and go about it would be to experience. To do this, do it over and over again. When you start working in the field and you start dealing with these laws and regulations on a daily basis, you start getting used to it. When you are working in the field, you know what's happening, the different changes, etc. Uh, you just start getting to have it. But uh, there's no such way that you can sit on a table, learn all the income tax ordinance, all the sales tax, act, all the rules, because uh, even if you are a brilliant one, you will learn that. But you will forget that if you are not practicing. So the best way is to experience that, practice that. Kamar Rahman, excellent practical webinar. Thank you, Kamar. We are glad you enjoyed it and we were of value. Mati Behmad, can tax consultants charge services tax in Punjab? No, Mati, tax consultants cannot charge services tax sir in Punjab that is charged by PRA. Tax consultants can charge their own professional consultancy fee which is not related to the sales tax on services in Punjab. 
sales tax on services is administered by provinces in the province of punjab it is done by pra punjab revenue authority kasim kasim thank you sir you are most welcome kasim appreciate your kind response atar akil good to see you back sir it's a great and useful session thank you atar good to be back uh, in fact i'll share with you guys um well there has been a gap this year because uh, my mother was in well and uh, i wanted to spend much the maximum time with her obviously that's a priority unfortunately uh, she passed on to the heavens in fact it's been almost three months so in fact i would request you all to kindly remember her in your prayers pray for her higher place in heaven and jannatul firdaus to ami so that was the reason for the absence but uh, we were just discussing that today inshallah uh, now that we are back it would be even better than before and hopefully we should be able to contribute for your betterment and to ensure that we can pass on skills to you which are useful for your careers and your professional life uh well thanks for welcoming us moiz ahmed does labor charges provided by the company comes under services tax or goods tax well depends on what were the labor charges for likely labor is for providing services and it should come under services but if the company is like dealing 99.9% in goods and there is one of labor charge then practically that's just club instead of just for one transaction you get a registration and once you file one transaction return so it really depends on the nature of the business and the nature of the transaction amza dar said i have worked 3 years in uk tax firm and i have good knowledge of the uk tax individual partnership and corporation i am now working as a controller in us healthcare related business but now i am looking to do ea irs certified enrolled agent course do you have any knowledge on ea IRS certified enrolled agent. Uh, how different it is from VAT? Uh, Hamza has just gone after asking this question. Hamza, it is different. UK tax system is uh, particularly in its practical approach different from the UK VAT. Pakistan's sales tax system is a very close replica, not entirely. but overall in its essence it's very close replica of the uk tax system so you can have an idea you have worked there you have worked here you should have an idea of the differences entering on position sorry ma'am sorry not at all tahir awan very informative well thank you tahir ziller rahman thank you so much you are most welcome ziller rahman Abdul Rakeem, thanks a lot, sir. It was very useful session for me. Well, thank you, Abdul Rakeem. We appreciate your appreciation. Kasim, uh, Kasim, how can I get experience in sales tax while my job is not related to this? Well, very simple, Kasim. Start getting your hands on the relevant work within your organization. that's the way to get experience or if you are interested then consider a career move in this area fahad hamid prayers and condolences sir thank you fahad avash yunus and i love you and i love you jazakallah avash may your mother rest her soul in peace in the highest place in heaven abdul rakeem jazakallah hamid chaudhry fazal khalid so what is meant by non creditable input do these all fall in exempt category and why are these deducted in calculation as no sales tax is payable on exempt input they are basically taken out they are not just exempt items they are items on which sales tax is not allowable for example uh, you have done a transaction with someone who was not registered now that's not an allowed transaction and that is why it's deducted it's not just the exam transaction only if you'll go through the return it's written in the bracket in front which i've shown you in the presentation to beside exam uh, items there are other items involved as well 
Ali Aslam, why don't I buy a company with whole PRA tax of supplier company invoice if it holds a company status? <coughs> You do have to withhold as per the PRA withholding rules. Sumaya Fatma, really good and informative session. Thanks a lot. Your explanations are really good. Thank you, Sumaya. Really appreciate your kind input. And we are glad that we were able to deliver value. Muhammad Ali, very nice. Thank you. Sayyid Nazim Abbas, last but not the least, if a category uh, service provider gives pack portals as well. Okay, I'm assuming you mean to say if a service provider also provide packed bottles, if that remains around 10% of the total bill, will he submit a separate supply related return to FPR as well? Uh, in my professional opinion, yes, he should. Because if it comes to an audit, unless uh, there is a very particular scenario which would be complicated to discuss here, but uh, that's not normally the case unless you can justify it essentially for providing the service and all that. <clears throat> In my opinion, they should file a separate return with FPR for that portion. Uh, Zaid bin Afaq, very useful and informative session. Thank you, Zaid. Muhammad Qasim, thank you, sir. You're welcome, Qasim. Muhammad Hamad al Hassan, thank you, sir. Very fruitful. Well, thanks, Samad Muizamah. Does withholding taxes apply differently on company and on single owner on a company? For example, four and a half percent on filer or non filer. <coughs> Moise, that is uh, regarding income taxes. Uh, it's not relevant, but since we do have some time left, I will answer yes, it's different for filer and non filer, but there's no distinction between a single member company or a two member company or any other company. If it's a corporate entity, it's a filer, the filer at the corporate rate will be applicable. If it's non-filer, that rate would be applicable. The distinction is along two lines, filer, non-filer, and companies and other than companies. Uh, for others, this was a question Moise asked in the context of income tax. It's not relevant to today's session. <coughs> Umair Ijaz, thanks for an excellent PRA refresher. You are most welcome, Umair. Thanks for your kind compliment. It was a wonderful session full of learning. Thank you, Umar Zahi Mirsaab, NACC Pakistan. And of course, your mother is in our prayer, sir. May Allah give you sabar and the highest place to her in Jannatul Pradas. Amin Atnan Tan. Amin Atnan, Jalakallah, thank you very much. Really appreciate your kind comments and your prayers, and we hope we will continue to deliver value for you. Tariq Khan, thank you, sir. Highly appreciate it. You are most welcome, Khan, sir. The pleasure is ours. Faisal Samin Kader, thank you, sir, for this session. You are most welcome. Bilal Awan, nice session. Thanks. Thanks, Bilal. Sumaya Fatma, please keep your sessions on Saturdays. Attending session at office is a bit difficult. Uh, great idea, Sumaya, and uh, great minds think alike. I was just having a similar conversation to Harun here, and I suggested him the same. But uh, obviously, the administration team has to decide the schedule, considering the other fact, uh, factors. But since these topics are extremely important, uh, I have suggested them to keep them on Saturdays. Uh, do share your input if we have more than one session on Saturday on different topics. Like there is a session two or three or four hour in the morning on Excel, and then there is a session in the afternoon, three four hours on a taxation law area. Uh, would you guys be comfortable attending both, or would it be too much in a day? Just share your thought on that. Ram Ratan, wonderful session. Thank you, Ram Ratan. Sadaf Manzoor, thank you, sir. And ACCA, you are most welcome, Sadaf. Uh, Ram, thank you for this session. Uh, you are welcome. Thanks, sir, for the informative session. One last question. Do we have any website to get rates of all provinces regarding sales tax on goods and services? Both. Moise, Ahmad. you are most welcome, Moise. Uh, not a single official website, but you do have the website of individual bodies. And you can go on PRA for 
uh, sales tax on services act era i'll just quickly show you here you go go in downloads you have all the legislation download them the rates are inside there you want to go for same go to srb website same thing kpr is same thing fpr same thing so yes you have the rates available on separate sites but there is no single official site where all those rates are available and i wouldn't recommend you any non official site because you are not sure about the accuracy so uh, a bit of work involved go to the sites individually and collect the rates uh, from there server uh chabri uh chabri salak chabri sorry about that it would be okay uh thanks for the great session today okay uh well thanks sagar for the prayer and you are most welcome uh ram ratan i also want session on us sales tax on vat me too well i think that's the topic and discussion so what i would suggest is uh, why don't you send some emails to harun telling him that this topic interests you i'll also share with him and hopefully we'll get it done avash yunus i think one session in a day is sufficient but please the session should be on weekends okay um keep the inputs coming what if the weekend is not available should we do it in the weekdays or should we just wait till we have a weekend available or should we do multiple sessions on a weekend ali bakas very informative session sir thank you ali glad it was of value for you kindly take another session on uat vat uh that is planned we will do that inshallah uh please send an email to head of member affairs sharing your ideas uh you can also send me i'll also share with him mohammad moin khan dear sir thank you for the session i also suggest for session on saturday rather it is difficult to attend in the office you are most welcome uh moin sir i agree and that would be the first preference we will try to do these on saturdays Avesh Yunus, if weekend is not available, then session should be after office hours. Okay. After office hours mean what? Like after six. And would you be able to go for that mentally after a challenging day at work, nine to five, coming straight into the session? Would that work for you? Next. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciations, great. Uh, Sagar Ch Chabria on Friday after office hours. That is after five is also a good idea. Noted. Umar Hafiz Bhar Sahab, thanks Umar for this session. I agree with the guy and your suggestion. We must add a few session on global VAT system. Agree, Dumar. Uh, please send an email to that effect to Harun, Harun dot John at acca global dot com. Ali Wakas, if we can are not available, then length of the session should be around two three hours max. Uh, Sumaya Fatma, multiple session on weekends are absolutely fine. Weekdays are tough. Okay, noted. Great. Okay, guys. Uh, I guess that's pretty much it. uh we covered the session at as we planned and a bit more which was good uh you have these handy bits in the presentation and other uh, gifts for you in the handouts keep them handy they would be of value and benefit to you whenever you'll be filing the sales tax return with pra uh there is a plan for series of session on the sales tax return with regard to srv fprs and kpr which we'll be doing so um keep looking out for these and i wish you all the best if you have any questions you have my contact details please feel free to contact us thank you for your extensive support the kind appreciations and the huge interest keep that coming that's what motivates us same session on kpra is also required i'm not Yeah, that is planned. But please send the email to either me or Arul so we can follow that up. 
Thank you guys. Uh, thanks for your support. I'm glad this was of value to you. If you still have any question or after going to it, some question comes to your mind, I'm still available to you. Please feel free to contact. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Take care, guys.